Hey, welcome to Writer's Blockbusters, the show that treats the final edit of a movie like the script. I'm one of the hosts, Bob Rose, and my Instagram is at Thundergrunt Bob. <laughs> and, and now one of the other guys is going to introduce themselves. I'm choosing Jamie. Uh, I'm Jamie Nash. I am a screenwriter and the writer of Save the Cat Writes for TV and Save the Cat uh, BG Workbook. It's that's a more complicated one. Uh, and my Twitter handle, I'm still on Twitter, is Jamie underscore Nash. I'm Jimmy George. I am a screenwriter and script consultant. And uh, I don't even remember my Instagram handle. Um, <laughs> yeah, my, mine's like Jamie Nash 7657 or it's something. It's not catchy. Let's say that. It's you said, you have a bot handle, Jamie. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, 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 I went on there to, you know, spy on Bob or something. Right. <laughs> my my yeah, Twitter so. handle, I'm still on there, but I'm not really active. But I would, you know, please tag me. Um, is at Jimmy R. George. I'm still on Twitter, too. I was just making the joke. <laughs> la last night was the Twitter apocalypse, apparently. So. Oh, shit. I, yeah. I was, I was oh, too busy watching Barbarian. Apparently, yeah. the servers in Europe went down. So. Oh, my God. Yeah. So anyway, we're not going to talk about that. <laughs> uh but today yeah speaking of a world where nothing makes sense uh, <laughs> we're here to talk about the a movie from this year 2022 barbarian right yes but before, and we had we had oh. seven listeners reach out for this yes specifically request this episode so we're which, doing it which i think we're doing goes, it. and it goes to say how much of a interesting conversation can be had about the movie right <laughs> like we've already even said that between each other yeah yeah um <laughs> before we get into our talking points as we always do we're gonna go around the zoom table and just talk about our feelings on the movie and just give a short you know e siskel and ebert thumbs up or whatever <laughs> uh <laughs> you know uh who wants to go first <laughs> Um, I'll start. I'll start. Yeah, yeah, uh, it, so I have when I watch when I finished this movie for the first time, I didn't know how I felt about it um, because it was making me respond in ways that I didn't understand why it was making me respond this way. And then talk, normally when we do the podcast, we try not to share our feelings between each other. We broke we the to, rules. We broke the rules <laughs> here because I had to like. I had to like reach out to Jamie and Bob and be like, guys, like, I don't know how I feel about this. And anyway, discussing discussing it further helped me put my fingers on like what the movie was doing and why it was doing it. And I had a bit of a eureka that we're going to talk about for me, at least um, about like something with the craft that I think is like my favorite thing about this movie and uh yeah so second watch rewatch i liked it a lot more and i always when a movie doesn't uh hit me right the way that i think it's trying to i always try to go like why and i try to get to the bottom of that and uh and i did that this time and and yeah i enjoyed the i enjoyed the movie better the first time i will say, the second time i will say that first half uh, for me, the rewatch goes down because you know that Keith is not a bad guy and they're literally just two people in a room having a conversation um, for like 40 minutes. And so like, but uh, but the but I still enjoyed it more the second time. So I, I, I'm I'm in the middle on this movie. Uh, and and we'll... I mean, the fact that you would even adjusted at all <laughs> I, I didn't ex well you came in and for first told us how you felt i was like oh like, this is gonna yeah, be an episode i don't episode. have anything good to have i, I <laughs> thought it was gonna be hereditary level I, was like, I don't have anything good to say about this right. no i do i do and and, and yeah so there's there's me on the movie uh jamie yeah i i enjoyed it um i came to it late you know i watched it on cable but everybody said cable streaming whatever now who watches things on cable anymore <laughs> Even though I have so, cable. So, Jamie watched so it on TBS. public access. Jamie got the VHS <laughs> right. and the laser disc. Super TV uh, had it on last night. <laughs> A CED <laughs> disc system. Uh, exactly. <laughs> so, so, yeah. So I watched it on HBO Max for the first time. And it's, um, uh, so I knew like go in cold, don't know anything. So you then you're kind of like ready. You're kind of trying to be like, okay, what's going to happen? Uh, you know, is this guy up? 
a UFO or what is he? You know, I don't know what the heck. <laughs> is. I'm, so you're, the whole time you're like, is he going to turn into a werewolf? Is she a werewolf? I don't know. I'm always <laughs> guessing werewolf. Um, uh, every so, single movie. <laughs> every movie I'm like, somebody's about to turn into a werewolf at some point. Uh, the moon's out. Is the moon out? Um, so, you know, I, be, I, go yeah. in, I go in kind of aware of that. Uh, I and, and honestly, you know, my attention span is short these days and I watch every horror movie and some of them I start checking out more earlier than others. And this one I didn't check out in, which means the execution of the beginning was keeping me interested. They kept building this slow burn dread and I and the two actors were decent and the situation was interesting. And then uh, and then the twist happened. And honestly, once the twist happened, maybe I lost a little bit of interest because now I knew what the twist was. And it kind of devolves into a movie I've sort of seen before, but because of the way it's structured is different. You know what I mean? But it it's not once once the monster's introduced, it starts feeling a little bit similar to it. But what makes Ew. it different is the merging of the two, right? That's what makes it different. So it's like it's two different movies that they kind of merged together in this cool interesting way uh and therefore that's what makes it because you get like two halves of something and there's a big surprise in the middle so all that's to say i i liked it it's it'll be a movie i remember at the end of the year like if you said what are your top 10 horror movies this will probably fall on it um just because it did keep me engaged for that reason that's what i got um yeah, uh, so I, Jam Jamie, I watched it on HBO Max too. So it's not. I don't know why you were singling yourself out for that. I didn't oh, actually see it in the theaters. Uh, uh, only, <laughs> only to mean, only to mean like the the twist is something I was waiting for. You know okay, what I mean? Gotcha. As mm, opposed to like, okay. if, if you had gone in cold, truly to the theater, like maybe opening you, weekend, like yeah, yeah, maybe that, maybe that monster coming out of the hallway would have been a complete shocker. You know, like, right. oh, wow, I went to see this thriller and now there's a monster in it. I don't, I don't right. know what's going on. So um, so I, I I definitely dig the movie, especially a lot more than some of my uh, friends. I've seen I've seen devices. I've seen some people absolutely love it. Some people absolutely hate it, you know, and I definitely am one. Of the I definitely lean towards love. I enjoy it a lot. Uh, it more so than anything, maybe unlike you guys, I just. I really enjoy how funny it is to me. Not the first part necessarily. The first part I think is a really good exercise in tension. And I like the meta casting of Bill Skarsgård because he's like, you know, he's Pennywise. So it's like, there's this little, like it, when is the, when is Pennywise mm -hmm. going to turn yep. into the monster? The whole brilliant time. casting. Yes. Right. Right. It's like a little meta casting and stuff for that. And so I enjoy all that, but I mean the second, the watch I did, I watched it twice for this episode the second watch i found justin long as horrible of a care despicable of a character as he is his performance to me is absolutely hilarious like i really find him in, in like insanely funny in this movie and yeah i don't want to cut you off for me i did that's something i didn't say right that was my problem right and that's i was trying to save it for the tone and we'll get in there but right right i laughed yeah. harder i laughed harder at this movie then I have laughed at any movie this year. And right. for me, that left me going, yeah, I don't like that. And and why don't I like that? Um, and uh, and so, yeah, I, I don't think that's I'm I, sorry. No, no, yeah. that's fine. I think that's uh, super interesting. Me and you usually respond to movies differently in that yes. way. Yes, yes. Like, because I'm, I'm like, I, I'm one to embrace what the movie's <laughs> doing with that like you know there's the moments in this movie where it's like yes i think justin long is a, i love justin long but there's moments of execution in his performance that are legitimately hilarious yes intentionally so <laughs> yes intentionally so. so right basically bob's the guy cackling in the audience and people are turning around like why is this guy laughing <laughs> i actually usually don't I yeah, don't do like, the audible laughing much I, unless it really hits me hard. I don't I remember no, for me. Oh God, Jamie, yeah, no, no, it's like it's like, you know, Bob's there and people are turning around like, what what movie Who is this is guy this watching? Dude. Yeah. This is the I most might horrible been. thing I ever saw. Sadly, I, I would love you know what? I would in it's one of those movies where in retrospect, I would have loved to have seen this 
in the old days. Oh, yeah. Uh, Friday night, 8 a p.m. 1995 a Friday screen. Yeah, with like a bunch of friends and a packed theater and people just going wild. Yeah. That's like the experience you lose watching it at home completely. Like, yeah, you know totally. What I mean? Yeah. And yeah, like, if so, I guess that's a compliment for the movie, really. I wish I could have seen it in a bigger setting than mm-hmm. my house. Same. And I don't say that about every movie anymore. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. So, I, yeah. so yeah i did enjoy it and i t- i think i tend to when when justin long is introduced the movie got more interesting for me as opposed to what I, J- jamie you said it you kind of lost you there but for me i was like no i'm in because it sold me when you know he's driving in the car and singing and then everything happens with you know, and i'm <laughs> yeah. just like and i'm just like all right i mean yeah. <laughs> like after yeah. all that just <laughs> I, the wildness of it i really enjoy and and yeah and then the performance of it mm-hmm. and uh yeah so there you go there you go i think yeah we got like a nice <laughs> we got a nice scale of enjoyment between yeah. all three of us <laughs> on that uh so jamie who wrote this shit <laughs> the writer of this particular film is zach gregor you mean Zatch, right? No, Zatch. Uh, Zatch <laughs> Treger. Zatch. Um, and from my Google Googleified research, Zatch or Zach, if that is his real name, uh, <laughs> he was in he was in a New York City based comedy troupe called The Whitest Kids You Know, which yeah. I really wasn't that so familiar with. I I learned last yesterday that I was the only fan of that and that's okay. I'm not judging anyone. I was a huge fan of Whitest Kids You Know back in the aughts. Like they had their own that it was on IFC. I think the channel was IFC. Okay. And they were kind of like a pseudo baby kids in the hall. Okay. That's like what they had it that, sounded like. Yeah. They they had that like type of uh humor about them and stuff. So there's a lot of sketches that still like are kind of legendary from the that live on in YouTube and stuff. And so I'm very familiar with Zach Krager in that way. I didn't know going into this that it was the whitest kids you it was one one of the whitest kids you know. And when I found <laughs> that out, I was like, What? Like that dude? <laughs> that guy did this? Okay. Because his only other directorial debut, isn't it like it's Miss March or something? Or it's like his um, other feature is Miss March, which is that Playboy Mansion movie that did not do well. <laughs> mm. Yeah. So, but I think it's interesting to note, to, to March, highlight yeah. the 20-year resume in the industry. Absolutely. And specifically in the comedy sector. So and There's a weird parallel with jordan peele here mm-hmm. since mm-hmm. he yep, comes from sketch exactly. comedy that's now, what i'm saying yeah yeah he's now known for horror will you're picking do- up what i'm putting down bob no no totally i'm just saying like <laughs> will i'm sure that zach krieger will get more deals right and probably make more mm-hmm. horror movies so is he like <laughs> you know according to what the name of the troop was is he the white white kid version <laughs> of jordan peele <laughs> oh my gosh right it's the and name it, of the troop you know i know yeah, i know it's the name of the troop it's there there's a um there, you know a question i used to always get asked like people would say you know you do horror and you do kids movies or you do comedy and it was i'd really say even the kids movies it's more about the comedy and i used to always say to me in my head because i started writing comedy and then i switched to horror i always found them to be almost very very similar yeah. like it was like I was manipulating certain reactions in the audience. And to me, those things were jokes because to me, I was cackling on the inside when I was like, oh, I'm going to do this to the audience. And I was laughing. Um, the importance of tension in both and horror tension, and yeah. comedy is very, you know, and, and setting it up like in some ways, like a joke and then, a scare, and then just yeah. nailing somebody with it and stuff. And they were kind of a lot like huge laugh out loud moments you'd set up in a comedy the horror the horror beats the scare beats were very similar so i i always found the two basically in in my mind to be very similar uh writing it at least constructing it yeah just like just like with the everything everywhere all at once episode i almost brought in the 11 types of jokes uh example here and and i was like theorizing that we might be able to 
find an example of everyone in this movie, <laughs> which would have been like an interesting thing. But, you know, we have so much to talk about that I decided not to do that. But to speak to but, what you're but saying, it could there, be done. It could be. Yeah. Done. Like, that's the yeah. important part. Yeah. I, I would say that this movie, we'll get to it later, but this movie has maybe my favorite, like, joke cut of the year easily like there's a moment in this movie where i was just like that's genius like the actual like the cut of the joke and everything was perfect <laughs> you know but you think that's a pattern we'll see because studios are really weird and they'll be like these these uh sketch guys they're making these horror movies that are hitting with people mm-hmm. <laughs> really i have no <laughs> pete, idea pete pete davidson pete will be davidson directing the movie. next horror movie <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, oh man i don't want it <laughs> <laughs> or I maybe mean, it'll be great i know i mean i like the king of staten island his there judd apatow movie but whatever mm-hmm. um yeah it's just an interesting thing where the people yeah, like with hubie people. halloween was pretty scary so <laughs> <laughs> hey i like hubie halloween <laughs> we're doing that next year jamie don't okay. even argue <laughs> okay hubie, hubie halloween that's the one <laughs> um all right Let's, uh, oh, wait, we talk about how much this made? Uh, say- yeah. So here on Wikipedia, uh, it sounds like that's my office. Here at Wikipedia, we like to talk about <laughs> box office. Um, it, it says 44.9 million. I, I don't know if that's domestic or that it's probably domestic. mostly domestic. Yeah, it sounds um, domestic. Because this movie probably, it, it may not even have hit international markets at this point or something Interesting. like that. Um, I'm just making that up. I but, have no but it's that's it's a pro it's profitable, right? I don't even know what the, it has to be low budget. It, it's got four point five four point five million as the budget, which sounds right. This sounds like a five so million. It, under it's like style. a Get Out, right? Because Get Out, was yeah, like ten 4. times 5. its budget just yeah. in domestic. Wow. Well, now here's the weird thing about this movie because this movie, when I watched, it, I was like, that this is an expensive movie. This is uh, expensive looking, yeah, yeah. Because and and I'll tell you why I felt expensive is because that neighborhood they had to build uh because you know that's not something you find you kind of have to because you know when they do the flashback like all the houses are nice and stuff like that it's hard to do in a five million dollar budget this movie was shot in bulgaria that's that's part of it do you think that the houses were still they were just there already well my gut is you can get people to build quick houses or (laughs) something in bulgaria for cheaper or something i don't know I, i don't maybe they I don't know. I, like that that part about the house is I'd like to know because that's expensive to make that cookie cutter. Mm-hmm. You know, some people might even do CGI now for something like that. You know, and then just mm-hmm. do the degraded houses. But then to do both versions, like the the wrecked versions and the I mean the wrecked versions would obviously be easier or something. Maybe I don't know. I anyway, I know, it yeah. seems but like they, ex- they did a per- they did a nicely nineteen eighties version that was. Yeah, it looked good. I mean, it looked. It good. did look good. The the rest of this movie is relatively cheap, but when I see that part, I'm like, how did they how did they pull that off on a budget? Mm-hmm. Um, so impressive. Maybe they, were, maybe they were all CGI models. <laughs> yeah, it could be. I mean, I wouldn't <laughs> even throw it past them. You know, like, miniatures, you know, miniatures, were, and then they yeah. they edited them in. Yeah, force yeah. <laughs> force perspective. They were all. Like, yeah. <laughs> They're all in little like toothpicks, really close to the camera. <laughs> um. So okay, let's let's talk about this uh, first issue that we got on the slate, which is a nice little pun, uh, <laughs> claiming mental real estate. <laughs> uh huh. Uh-huh. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I figured this was a good episode for Jamie to revisit this one we've talked about a few times. This is like a great example of it. Yeah, men- mental real estate, it, and when I think about it, it's a lot like and. It- kind of is real estate in, in my book and save the cat rates for tv i talk about worlds and i say worlds are the most important thing in television mental real estate and worlds are very similar in some ways uh they're story arenas so it's some kind of some kind of thing you're almost claiming uh it's it's uh some kind of story arena you're claiming claiming for yourself and it could be anything from um dinosaurs like when you think mm-hmm. if i asked you like like, what movie do you think of when you think what movie claimed dinosaurs? You'd probably say Jurassic Park. Carnosaur, of course. Um, if, I, <laughs> if, I, if, <laughs> yeah. if I said, uh, 
tornadoes, what would you think? Uh, Sharknado. No, you'd say Twister. <laughs> and then Shark, Sharknado would be second, I think. It, well, my yes, mind, it would be. Honestly, yeah. sadly, um, sadly. So they maybe. took two mental real estates and put them together. Yeah. yeah, yeah, right. sh- yeah. Sharks might be a similar thing. Um, space Marines. I don't know what you'd say. Yeah. Well, whatever Troopers, the thing is. Yeah. yeah. So Aliens. Th- yeah. Th- this is what I mean by like, can, is there a piece of mental real estate that's unclaimed? Can you go grab it? Has anybody made the definitive blank movie? And that's the what thing you're always going to be compared to when you make a movie about that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Right. It's the Terry Rossio idea, right? It's, it's a Terry, Terry Rossio concept. Idea. Yeah. And I think he used the concept of in, an, in his article on wordplayer.com of Kleenexes in how like, you know, it was the first to do it right. To be tissues that you blow your nose in. And, and so it like, you know, claimed that mental real estate so much that we don't call often most people don't call them tissues they call them kleenexes you know and like the idea of like a bad you know it's that type of thing and for this you know the airbnb horror movie there have been multiple airbnb horror movies but they haven't been done well enough to claim to stake their claim in that mental real estate they, they like, haven't been when you the think airbnb the Airbnb. so yeah. it's like now whenever you say airbnb you know a person who's like got their fingers on the pulse of horror is immediately going to be thinking about like the next time they check into an airbnb is it going to be like the barbarian scenario right like it, it's like so, going into the like going into the water from jaws and the right stuff that you're never going to go life. into right. the ocean Without thinking Watching about, is there a shark out there? Static you know? on a television from Poltergeist. For Poltergeist. So yeah, it, like, yeah. I think it's a really good tool when you're coming up with ideas of like, how can I take something and do something with it no one else has ever done before so that I claim that mental real estate in the audience is mine forever. It's so powerful. And it's also a really good brainstorming tool in general. Not just with not just for the concept itself, but within the concept, right? Like, uh, like next time I go to an Airbnb, if I'm in a basement, I'm gonna be looking around for string coming out of a wall, like, <laughs> right? And then like, run. not like I'm going to Airbnbs like crazy, but you know, yeah, it's just even within the little, even within the movie itself, like you said, the static on the TV. There's opportunity to take something and and claim that mental real estate, so that every time the audience experiences it in real life, they think about your movie. Do you yeah. think that Airbnb is the one aspect of this movie that does that? Or because or do you think there's other stuff in it like like the type like you said, Jamie, you were familiar with the le- like the last third, you know what I mean? Like I don't know what you Yeah, that, I'm not but I'm not sure whatever that last third is is um the monster itself. Yeah, any, something like that. Like I don't, I'm not sure that that's mental real estate because it feels like I've seen the, the kind of mother mm-hmm. baby thing. Mother even baby, though I, yeah, can't, I, I don't know. Even though I can't think of what movie that would be, maybe it's, it's horror movies called Mother, right? Yeah, if, yeah, it feels familiar. It feels yes. familiar. Yeah, maybe yes. it's just not executed to the point where I'm like, that's the definitive, right, right, monster mother baby movie, or, or yeah. maybe that's just not, uh, that's too vague of a thing to be like a piece of real estate that's not sure. yeah it's, it's got to be something a little buzzy that's in everybody's head or yeah. some topic we all know that when i pitch it familiar right yeah it's you know what you know what's interesting when you were saying it though i was thinking you almost want to become the movie that becomes the this meets this like mm-hmm. nobody exactly. would say nobody would say like um um i'm trying to think uh what's a what's another shark movie besides jaws off the top the of your head uh, open water <laughs> Deep Blue Sea was the one I had in my head. And then I went to open water and I'm like, that's not quite right. But nobody would say like Deep Blue Sea meets Twister. They'd say Jaws meets Twister. You know what I mean? Yeah. So yeah. You want to yeah. be, if there's something that doesn't have a Jaws yet and you can claim it first, yep. it's, it's almost like IP, really. It's like, yeah. it's something else that sometimes this could be a historical thing. Sometimes it could be a public domain uh, character or that you re, like that. re, reimagine. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, yep. there's all there's all kinds of ways um, you can do. You this. could make other movies where people check into Airbnbs and find things, right? Yep. So yeah. Barbarian yeah. meets this. Yeah. Barbarian meets that. Meets this, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. I 
I was almost going through like um, Spielberg because I was like the shark movie, um, the archaeologist movie, the you know, movie. the the UFO movie, you know, yep, it's the like, haunted house movie, the, the haunted II house movie, movie you know, World Holocaust War Two movie. movie. Yeah, he's got a lot of ones uh, that he's kind claim of claim that mental real estate. Claim, yeah, right. yeah. Also, so. I, I, something I noted to you both last night that goes with this is Airbnb is all the letters of Airbnb are in the title. Barbara. I love that. <laughs> right. I don't know what that means exactly, but it's true. <laughs> so, is that? Um, it took me a second watch to remember to realize that the street name was Barbary, Barbary Lane. Right. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. I was like, oh, okay, I get. It. The title can come from many places. Yeah. Um. Uh, so on this show, we often call the movies that we watch. I think it's more of a thing that we kind of made up i don't hear this anywhere else we call movies that we usually talk about cheeseburgers marvel movies mm -hmm. or cheeseburgers uh you know like basically superhero movies blockbusters all them cheeseburgers spielberg makes great cheeseburgers the hollywood standard the hollywood standard right so the question for all of us is is barbarian a cheeseburger does it qualify as that <laughs> Yeah. Uh, Jamie, I want to hear your take on this first. So cheeseburger is really about who's the audience, right? Mm -hmm. Is this for is this for uh, Friday night or somebody flying through HBO Max that's looking for a fun time on a Friday night, but but isn't a connoisseur of movies that isn't isn't <laughs> like checking out Nomad Land in the art house theater or something? And that, that's kind of the difference. It's like it's like the it's the audience really it's like is this for everybody or is this for like people that have seen too many horror movies and now need to, to really go deep in their dive to get a to get the buzz um, they need the real sick stuff right <laughs> yeah yeah and i actually think this is a cheeseburger i that's my call because i think i think this knows you're a cheeseburger audience and then screws with you that's what I think this one does. So I think it is a cheeseburger. I absolutely agree with Jamie there. You got I, it. Yes, I, I, think, I think it's, you know, a lot of people called this, you saw a lot of reviews that said it's wild. It's crazy. You got to see it. But the type of review that's coming from and for the people it's aimed at are the people Jamie just talked about. Like, it's mm -hmm. wild if you're kind of a just a casual film goer. <laughs> I've seen movies way crazier than this. You guys have too. Yeah. But you know what I mean? Like it's wild. Yes, exactly. Average, yes. We average have. <laughs> movie watcher. It's, it is wild. It is. But if you're like, you can't go to a horror convention and be like, barbarians wild. They'll be like, yeah, it's, it's fine. <laughs> like, like, it's, it's, <laughs> it's like, you know, it's, it's not that crazy. You know, I've seen crazier. Yeah. I, 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 I was trying to, I was thinking about, it made me think about pig and yeah. how mm -hmm. we said pig is, is a three course meal. You know, like it's not a cheeseburger, but this doesn't really function like pig. It fun functions like like a cheese. I, I, I think it's a cheeseburger. It's like going to McDonald's. And then when they give you the burger, the patties are on the outside and, uh, you know, all the pieces of the Big Mac are there. And someone runs all, out in the kitchen and squirts ketchup all, in your face. Yeah, they're all they're all <laughs> they're all there. They're just out of order. And then you bite into it, and it tastes exactly the same when you bite into it. But the pieces are all out of you know are assembled weirdly, and that's that. It's so uh, it's like the assembly of the sandwich is different, but the t the flavor is see, the same. See, I'll take that metaphor deeper. I think that the <laughs> the thing in it is hidden inside between the buns <laughs> and as you bite into it you're like mm, spicy or something like that <laughs> yeah oh they got a secret sauce got a secret oh. nougat it's got a, a spicy <laughs> nougat in there oh, is that there Thousand Island? yeah yeah, yeah <laughs> right and there just to be clear i really want to say we're not saying that's bad Being no a not at all it's not bad like we're here the show celebrates cheeseburgers it's a celebration it's just, of cheeseburgers it's more of a question of like jamie said audience and intention who's mm -hmm. it for? who's it aimed yep. at? yep who's it for and, it it kind of dictates the decisions you make to an extent. And because this one does go in some weird decision making choices, mm -hmm. um, normally when you when you land on a film that makes weird choices, you're outside of the cheeseburger realm. Like it's somebody trying to do something different. They're not trying to entertain us in the same way a cheeseburger would. Yeah. But I I think this one is trying to entertain us in the same way a cheeseburger would, but using some weird 
weird tricks. And I'll, let me use this super quick to kind of talk about some of the things if you see in the interview uh, with with the director is he said he tried to sell this and he took it to everywhere and they every place wanted him to change it. They they were like, oh, you can't you can't um, introduce a character on page 50 or whatever it was. Uh, you can't do that. You can't introduce a main character on page 50. You can't give up on the main concept on page 50. You can't have a sexual abuser be your main hero and the thing, you know, and they all wanted him to change. And, um, and he kind of said, you know, he said, well, that is what the movie is. I can't, you know, rearrange it, this thing. And he eventually got the Boulder light entertainment and, uh, they did a deal with, uh, I guess was Boulder lights, a branch of Fox. So it's Hulu and Disney. So essentially what I'm saying is the, the mother character is a Disney pr princess is what I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> also i want to say take a take a, a a snapshot of what jamie just said there is him saying that you can't change like the protagonist being a sexual abuser because that is the movie i want that mental snapshot for later when we talk about theme a little yeah bit. nice because setup i, I, I really because if that's that important to him i think that does speak to uh theme and and mm -hmm. stuff right mm -hmm. um but before we get there let's talk about maybe the most important aspect of the movie i think for everyone is, and wasn't on the original talking point yeah, right was wasn't like... part of it <laughs> was just tonal whiplash we talk about mm -hmm. tone a lot on the show um i feel like the thing we bring up most is the batman scale right mm -hmm. is when we talk about tone jamie, jamie i'm gonna that, make you do it again is that jamie's thing i mean we can yeah. explain it if jamie doesn't want to do it <laughs> it's jamie's thing it's it is jamie's thing we're not taking it away from jamie i just don't want to <laughs> say it the 900th it's, time it's even in the save the cat beat sheet workbook that you can write available on amazon jamie is it do, do i use batman i don't know maybe i, I do. Don't I, can't, I can't remember it's been so long since i wrote it but well, there's a hero could you scale. use you know mm -hmm. who could you use who's got a million movies like dracula or something mm -hmm. dracula yeah dracula. Dracula probably work I, I don't know the dracula movies well enough to do it though so i'll use batman um you know, i i could think of like love at first bite would be a what no dracula um, dead and loving it Jack, yeah, you know, it's once bitten it. yeah. and yeah, yeah. yeah. So the tonal scale is just a way to kind of figure out your tone by using sim similar movies that you can think of and creating a scale of one to 10 and putting your similar movies on it. And you're trying to go to extremes. You're trying to get what's the broadest, most um, silly kind of goofy tone. And that'll end up toward the one, two, three area. And then what's the most dark and serious tone? And that'll end up toward the, you know, eight, nine, 10 area. And we use Batman because there's so many Batman movies with so many different tones that you could put like the Batman up towards like eight or nine and Nolan Batman would probably fall somewhere in eight, eight or nine. And, uh, but then as you move down the scale, maybe Tim Burton's Batman is like five or something. Maybe Joel Schumacher's is four Maybe Adam West is three. Maybe Lego Batman is one. So you get this big scale of of uh, tones, basically, and that's and, that's what the tonal scale is. And I remember you've talked about how that helps. That's been help helping you in your collaborations to align yeah. with the writer. Yeah. If you come up with that Batman, <laughs> everybody knows Batman, right? <laughs> yeah. If you come up with that scale for your own thing, and you don't have to use the same character. I mean, you could just do horror movies, for example, like. Like what's a what do, you, what do you guys think would be a a one tonal scale in the in the horror movie a list? One Army horror? Darkness, Army a one darkness? or two. Army, Army of darkness? darkness might be three. I three. Think. three. I would call Army of Darkness a maybe three. screen yeah. uh, scary movie or something scary like that. Scary movie's one probably a one. Movie. Yeah. 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 Maybe yeah. Sc maybe Scream ends up like a five or something like that. Right. Right. Because um, it still has that meta. Comedy. And then yeah, what's right. what's a ten? What's a the grimmest hereditary of, or hereditary like, maybe i mean hereditary is like a like an eight or, or nine yeah or maybe like a blair witch project or the something exorcist. that's supposed to be real yeah the exorcist is, the a, exorcist 10. is a 10 exorcist. yeah yeah yeah. Right. yeah so you could do a scale and then if you were working with somebody you could say where does our movie fit and it would be like yep. oh it's a six it's a seven um it's right above scream know. it's right right yeah. right there yeah and you could yeah. be like would would this kind of joke with this kind of scare with this kind of stylized universe fit in this tone and you could kind yep. of debate 
it's a way oh. to figure out whether your ideas are totally balanced with the rest of the with the rest of the work, right? And it's because audiences typically our cheeseburger audiences are turned off if you go to Nolan's Batman that's a nine or an eight that Nolan's Batman is an eight and you get Adam West Batman jammed in there, the audience typically might disengage, right? And be turned off by that. Why, why is that? What is Adam West Joker doing in Nolan Batman, right? Like it's, it's a tonal imbalance. You see, and, you've seen this with Marvel uh, recently a little bit. I've seen a lot of complaints about tone is they get so silly that people stop being able to take the dramatic element seriously. Mm -hmm. And then they're thrown off of the whole movie. Great yeah. thing. Cause I'm going to bring that back later. Right. Um, the, but, uh, as a, as a, you know, as a, a script consultant tone is the tone is the most difficult thing to, to, to teach tone is the most difficult because it's a lot of instinct, right? It's a lot of experience and craft to figure out how to make tone work and wield it as a tool. Um, like, like a newbie trying to write Deadpool, that's really, I mean, Deadpool, it takes a lot of craft and a lot of skill to make that tone work. Um, and, uh, so, and another example we gave recently, like that we've been real, you know, adding into this discussion is the movies that made us pretty woman episode has a, has a little anecdote with a screen cap of Disney's Disney has their own version of this. They call it the lightness scale. And originally pretty woman was like a seven was like a way more intense story and they 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 were like, we have to get this down to a four. Those were the exact numbers they used. Like Pretty Woman was a seven, and all the suits were like at Touchstone were like, no, we can't make this Gotta unless you back. can get this down to a four. So that that just like speaks to how this is on the minds of the people who are signing the checks, right? This it's is like definitely something that that people are looking at when they're deciding whether they want to invest in your story and your script. A, yeah, a, a personal um. And a personal story here. When I was an early screenwriter, I had a co-writer and we were comedy writers. We wanted to be comedy writers. And we were trying to really write uh, Fairly Brothers scripts. You know what I mean? That's what we were trying to do. We were trying to do something like Dumb and Dumber or um, uh, There's Something About Mary. They, they were the kind of scripts we were trying to write. And we kept writing things that I would describe. And it took me to kind of realize and raise my hand and said, I think there's a problem. We kept trying to out joke each other. You know, we kept trying to crack each other up in the bounce back and forth. And and while we had these concepts, we would end up with Simpsons scripts or Family Guy scripts. They felt more like Family Guy or something. They were completely untouched with reality. And because our concepts were more these kind of realism concepts that were supposed to be comedies, but then we just went off the rails with how goofy funny they were. Um because we used to think if it's funny, who cares? If they laugh, who cares? But it was it's to these aspects that you say, well, then the drama gets lost. Then nobody cares because everything becomes so they're, funny. They, they're probably great cartoon scripts, though. They're, they're great cartoon <laughs> scripts. They, <laughs> right. They'd be probably be great in half hour chunks because they were right. all about the jokes. It was just we were just trying to at, out laugh out loud each other with every single beat of the script. And it made the plot, which we also cared about, just unimportant. It was like, oh, this is just you know, one ridiculous thing after another. So the first thing we ended up having success with, you know, and this is no surprise, was we um, we had a script. I'm trying, I can't remember the title, but it was basically, and people did this after us. They kind of beat us to the punch, but it was a, um, it was a spoof of independent movies. So it was basically a scary movie script. That was the first thing we had success. So we thought we were this doing this other thing, but really we were writing like scary movie and ours was, Ours was called, it had one of those goofy titles, like, like, don't drink your juice in the hood. And, you know, it was like right, one right, of those. Right, yeah, 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 yeah. I can't remember it. Well, with I, a spoof movie, yeah. too, you want the jokes to be packed it, in there. Right. I mean, and, yeah. and, but that's like a one, right? And yeah, if that's you a have one. A, so, and yeah, if you yeah. have a story that's like playing on a five, we, that, it's we, like. We were yeah. writing ones and twos, but we thought we were writing fours and fives. We, we intended to write a four or five, but we were so into the joke that we were writing ones and twos. 
And so it didn't work, right? It didn't work until we realized we were writing ones and twos and purposefully wrote spoofs and animation. Um, And that was our first success. It was like, oh, no, we're writing a spoof. See, when we're trying to write this four or five, we're really writing this other thing. Um, (laughs) So once we once we actually wrote the other thing, um, we had a and when I say success, it didn't get made, but uh, it was like Harvey <laughs> Keitel's company. We had, we had, success we had Har- has many meanings there, Jamie. <laughs> yeah, I remember we had Harvey Keitel was like, or one of our gags was like he was he'd show up in all these independent movies, you know, so he had to show up on ours <laughs> playing himself or something. So, um, I remember his company, Harvey was like, Oh, I like this. This is this is my next <laughs> thing. Cool. I'll, be, I'll be in the spoof movie, you know, or whatever. So, <laughs> that's great. Um, no, but okay. it's it, it's just like it's 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 a very important thing to figure out during your writing process. And it's something that's hard to figure out, like in the middle of it. It's harder to figure out in the middle of it than if you decide upon something, you know, and then stick with it. Or, you, you know, you can adjust. But like I'm constantly reading scripts where there's like four or five moments that are completely different movies like they don't. They're, and that's because their tone is like it, they're giving me a two and the rest of the script is a seven. Right. And I'm like and and they just stick out. So they're so easy to point out. Be like page 12. You got this, the, the, you know, like you can't have fart jokes in Schindler's List, you know, um, that's an and, extreme example. But yeah, <laughs> but yeah, but like I so so I, I am constantly reading fart jokes and Schindler's List scripts, basically. Jesus. And yeah. Oh, yeah. All the time. Who? I you, can't. You'd, now, be, you'd be surprised how people. Uh, yeah. Because tone because tone is 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 not for it's in hard, my experience, it's, it's in my experience understand. for people. Yes. In my experience for people who are just starting and learning the craft, there's a complete it's it's a it, it's a lot like premise delivery and that it's not something that people are concerned about. It's they just have all these ideas and they throw them on the page and they're not thinking about tonal balance at all. It's not even it's not even in their mind as something they need to care about. So, yeah. I, so you I, get fart jokes in Schindler's List. I'm not for fart jokes in Schindler's List, but I admit that I am somebody who sometimes enjoys the tonal salad movies. Mm-hmm. I do because that usually the ones that like kind of are kitchen sink movies. You know what I mean? They like, tried mm-hmm. everything, and it didn't really work for audiences, but it might work for me. You know, <laughs> so I, I I'm aware of that though. Um, what the one thing we haven't talked about is how does this apply to Barbarian? <laughs> Right. That, I, yeah, that was right. all a big setup for, <laughs> all okay, setup, this is right. how these things work. Right, right. right. Yeah. No, oh, it's not in Barbarian. Sorry. Yeah, no. Barbarian <laughs> perfectly toned. Uh, let's move on. <laughs> okay, I'll start, and then you guys can kind of bounce off. I, sure, yeah, I just yeah. When I messaged Bob and Jamie after I left this movie for the first time, after I watched the movie, it was about tone. And it was that I was laughing my ass off so, so frequently during the course of this movie that I was a little, you know, I, it was, it didn't feel right to me. And I was trying to put my finger on, and I didn't understand um, that that's what it was trying to do. And that was my big thing. Like how, why are you trying to make me laugh in the face of like, in like seven, eight, nine level darkness you're trying to make me laugh at a god, dude. The bottle, that the bottle, that, it's that hilarious. Giant baby bottle. <laughs> it's, no, it's, it's, a, it's a gross so out joke, funny. and it's funny as hell. Like, so, it exists so, too. Like who so, made that bottle? <laughs> and and my my only thing about the tonal part of this is, I think there is a divide in the middle. I think in the yeah. beginning, he's basically playing it straight, like yep. this is some kind of thriller. But then once you get to that monster attacking and then you get to Justin Long singing in the car, he's basically <laughs> saying it's time to laugh. This, OK, to stop taking yourself so seriously. Let's have fun. And yeah. that, that cut oh. within itself is the joke. Mm-hmm. It's not just him singing in the car. It's the cut too from <laughs> from Bill Skargar- Skargar's gruesome death like, <laughs> to a bright, sunny Pacific Coast highway. Right, right. Right. And you're like, you're like, what the, because you don't, you have no idea like how this fits in the movie. You're totally off balance. <laughs> it really is reestablishing the movie. Like it's kind yes. of, oh, I gotcha. And now <laughs> we're doing this thing, you know, and no, at, but- that po- 
at that point you can't really put that back in the bottle you know at, yeah. at that point you're yeah, yeah. you're like we're on to you so he kind of has to change tone at that point pretty much at that mm. point or yeah. or we do at least mentally we, we have, have to get really we have it. to get on board or just yeah. turn it off yep that's and, right. that, and that would probably and, be where it lost a lot of people mm-hmm. too I so, assume, some people right? probably wanted that movie and then he said sorry i'm doing this other movie it's, it's, <laughs> yeah. no and and so so i was trying to get my put put my finger on what was happening why i was feeling the way what it was doing with tone and why it was working for so many people because a lot of people love this right so so and it made me think about everything everywhere all at once which which has a very similar approach in that like it's playing with it's going from a three to a five to a seven to a one to a three but but usually when in this lightness and darkness scale the self-awareness changes and i think in the case of everything what what you guys helped me figure out in the, the eureka moment for me at least about tone that i've never thought about and we're 88 episodes in and i've i'm, I'm closing in on consulting on 400 scripts um Tone is the one go back thing. And do all those? Yeah. <laughs> no, but what you're, what you're, what, no, because, because, because it, it never, it never has the moment. It's like we're in a horror movie. It never winks. It never. Mm-hmm. The characters, as you said to me, Bob, their terror is is real, and yes. their terror remains real in the face of this of these jokes. To them, it remains the scariest thing. That's ever happened, ever happened to, them. to them. Right. And they never stop being scared for their life and fighting for their life amidst these things that are intended to make us laugh at what's happening to them. Right. And the it, same it reads thing ridiculous I, to us, easily. to us, but to yeah. them, the ridiculousness is terrifying. And they never turn to the camera and say, it's like we're in a horror movie, which is a, a line I would say I've read at least a hundred times in scripts that are sent to me. Um, and don't ever write that line, please. Um, <laughs> um, you need to get so, a movie titled that. <laughs> it's like we're, we're in a horror, horror movie. movie, and I think Jamie that will it, write it. It's all jokes. It made me. It made me realize that uh, that's what everything, everywhere, all at once does. Despite all the mixes of tones that are dramatically different from moment to moment, those characters are never aware that they're in a movie. They are never winking at us. They are never saying, it's like we're in a movie where there's multiple dimensions and I'm playing different characters in those multiple dimensions. No one and everything everywhere all at once is is winking at us and reminding us that we're in a movie with them. And I think that is why this works. And I didn't, I didn't understand that that was the thing with tone. Like if you, if you keep the characters not, not self-aware, you can throw in a three and a four gag in a seven or eight dar- darkness right. moment and it can work. So it, that was really educational for me. And there's a lot movie. of subtle like levels once again. Thanks for helping me get. There, oh, guys. yes. <laughs> I'm just glad we I'm glad we helped. I was like, oh, man, are we going to have an episode where we all like yeah. violently I- different differ on this movie? <laughs> you know? No, but like it's it's nice. I, I it's nice to be able to wield tone as a tool yeah, and yeah. be able to understand like how to do more with it. So I was also yeah. like thinking like what are, I was thinking of other, I know you came to everything everywhere, but I was also thinking like, what's another example sort of of this that is on a much sillier scale. And I was like thinking like kind of, I was thinking the Sam, Sam Raimi came to my mind in our conversation even, cause I said the thing about Justin Long and uh, you know, drag me to hell. And I was like, like, like his movies are sillier and, but mm-hmm. like it, Ash's terror is real while he's also winking at the camera. You know, it's that's, all a dance. The, yeah, it's all are, a dance. That's, yeah, that's well, a that's a little I, different. Yeah, no, it is. Different. Are, I'm saying it's different. I'm yeah. saying it's a dance where you have to like adjust the movie to the awareness of the character to the mm-hmm. winking. You know, it's like three yeah. elements that all have to be adjusted. Yeah, that's a good triangle, right? It's there. a yeah, yeah, it's a triangle, like a trinity it, that you have to adjust. Tri- a trinity of tone. A trinity of tone, right? In some ways, like because Ash does a tonal whiplash like it goes to really silly slapsticky kind of stuff right, in army right. of darkness mm-hmm. i mean really silly stuff at times and then it backs off and is kind of serious but the one thing i was thinking of in regards to your um because i was trying to think of the same thing because there are 
one I get a lot because I'm I wrote the Save the Cat Rights for TV book. So a lot of people lately have been have been referencing White Lotus to me. I haven't seen mm. it. But... I haven't seen it. So yeah. White Lotus is a show that on the surface of it is very dramatic, but there's something about it that it's like you're kind of like oh this is a comedy but it's not jokey but it's like the music and everything else and it does this really weird balance of tone and and it's really hard to like land so when i get people that kind of come to me like i want to do something like white lotus i was like "Uh oh that's a hard one that's a (laughs) that's a really execution the dependent show yeah cl- is, craft yeah for a million different reasons it's got like mm-hmm. 10 characters they all have their own story they all kind of come together and it, it's a great show i love the show but um anyway it's it's kind of it reminded me of white lotus yeah. a little bit it, you- not that not that white lotus never goes to the places <laughs> like this or army of darkness goes like it never mm-hmm. has the whiplash right right it kind of always just stays in the same thing but under the surface of it it's kind of it's kind of ridiculous, but it's playing it like it's it's real. And, yes. and it's, it's almost like we're we're watching like, oh, OK, I know what this guy's. I think this is being funny, you know, or something like that. I, th- I think this I, is I, just, you know, I, I I think a little bit of this comes from his background in sketch comedy. That, yeah. Because the yeah. best sketches, I mean, the ones that I think truly stand out, especially the ones from his troupe, are ones where the characters are doing. Well, quite nuts things, but the characters are totally in. They're totally one hundred percent in on the reality of the sketch. Sketch comedy is different than script writing, of course. But you know what I'm saying? Like that bleeds mm-hmm. into this. Absolutely. And why, and why this feels like that? It's it's hard for a person like this to like be totally serious. You know what I mean? They're always <laughs> it has to make there's a always an Jordan Peele has to do the same thing. Joke. Yeah, Jordan Peele can't not be funny. You know but, what I mean? There's the, jokes in all those movies that I find really funny. As as I talk through the White Lotus thing, though, the Coen brothers really do that a lot, too. Totally. It's like, the Coen brothers are hilarious. Like, yeah. This is a dramatic story, and there's no jokes in it, but you're going to be laughing when you watch it. You know, yeah, like laughing. there's so many moments in Fargo where William H. Macy it's is absolutely like, fun. it's hilarious. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's a great example because, again, for him, in Fargo, when he's making us laugh, for him, he's terrified. It's zero self-awareness. He's scared for his life, for his future. He's scared out of his mind. So, And he, he's never winking to us, never loses, ne- never gains self-awareness, that he, you know, and never winks. Yeah, I think that's a key. And I think the Coen brothers and all their extra features and their interviews have shown that they're really about the comedy more than most people assume their their prestigious nature is kind of misguided in our in our culture you know what i mean mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. also tarantino thinks his movies are comedies he said that out loud several times mm-hmm. he views yeah. the, the the very important aspect so and there are plenty of huge laughs in those movies. yeah I, right right i remember way back when i saw pulp fiction uh you know i was into comedy and people would say well, what's a funny movie you've seen and i was like the movie I laughed the most at was Pulp Fiction when I was in the theater. And it it operated right. like a horror movie in some ways because it was really tense, like stabbing the needle through the heart or something like that. And it's like, yeah, everybody's tense. Oh, my God. But then they're making jokes like you do it. No, I'm going to do it. You know, and it's like, whoa. And um, yeah, I laughed harder at that movie in the theater that year than any other movie, you know, so. And yeah, when Marcel say- Swallow shows up on the street in front of Bruce, <laughs> yeah, it's a great laugh. It's it's, it's a funny. ridiculous moment in a you know a co- pure coincidence, and it's over the top silly in some ways, but it's a huge laugh. Yeah, it's a huge laugh. Yeah, and, and we, again, Bruce Willis is scared for his life, right? Right, like, right. He's, he's no, it's, it's legitimate terrifying. from the characters. Yeah, and you know, before we move on, I just want to say we've done both Pulp Fiction and Fargo on this show. We have. So you can check that out if you want to hear us dive into those much deeper. And um, leave a good review. Leave a review on Apple Podcasts. That's uh, why I'm that's why I picked those examples. I, I, I figured. I just wanted to really <laughs> reiterate it. Uh <laughs> let's talk about I forgot I think, we did those movies, to be honest. 
<laughs> to Jamie, it's always the first episode. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. We um, just he's like a pull string of screenwriting techniques. We just, yeah, we pull, just pull the pull string and he's like a monster in the house. We just start we start <laughs> exactly. the Jamie's we just wind the thing on the back of Jamie and he just starts talking. Um I'm just a recording at this point. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we have jokes we could just record Jamie's voice doing setting up the techniques and <laughs> And just push push a big button that push says, a button like, for half of the time. Yeah. Long lines, go. Okay. I'm sure there's an AI that just can kind of used skim. To be a, used to be a computer thing. programmer, right? So yes, I'm get sure on it, is. man. Sure um, He's like, I'll show up for ten minutes in the episode. Just use these for the rest of it. It'll be like, it'll be like a random number generator where I just say half man or something. <laughs> Oh, that's the bingo card right there. Um, <laughs> but I hear okay. Let's let's talk about the thing that I think most verbally applies to this movie, right? Let's talk about and it's something we, we have mentioned on this show several times. Monster in the house, Jamie. But, Jamie, <laughs> and I know it's funny because we just made all those jokes. Let me hit the recording. Our tonal scale in this episode is is all over the place. <laughs> yes. So, uh, something I've said a thousand times by now. <laughs> Go back and listen. At least to the eighty-seven. Last... At least eighty-seven. But if you're listening to the show for the first time, this if, is new to you. If mm-hmm. this is the first time, I'm going to do it. I, I like to do this as if it is your first time. I'm still trying to perfect, perfect it. So here we go. Uh, so there's there's a thing in Save the Cat called genres. Genres are not the typical blockbuster genre. I don't even know what it is. Barnes and Noble genre. I don't know what has genres now. Like like horror and sci-fi and comedy well, video stores there, don't exist so video stores don't exist yeah. but i don't know because amazon just hides everything in the, and it's weird it like books and stuff anyway uh so it's not sci-fi horror and comedy it's instead story patterns or classic it's like these are the 10 types of stories that exist um and there's ones like golden fleece where it's somebody chasing a trophy or goal and they have to go down some road they may have a team there's Buddy Love, which are friendship romance stories. There's Full Triumphant, which is some kind of underdog that triumphs in a group of people that underestimate them. And there's one called Monster in the House, which we do all the time because we do a lot of horror movies. Um, and Monster in the House doesn't have to be a horror movie, but most horror movies, if not 99.9% of them, fall into the Monster in the House pattern. Monster in the House has uh, three key elements and then one extra credit element it's um the elements are it has a house with and i I, the way i view the house is the house is a trap somehow people are trapped in a house and the house could be metaphoric it doesn't have to be an actual house it can be a it can be a place it could be a world in in some ways it could even be a body or something like that but some kind of Mm -hmm. and in doctor sleep we talked about it's their mind it's their mind yeah, Yeah. yeah yeah So something that I I think they just can't ex- escape. So think about the escape part. And if they can't escape it, if they're trapped in it, there's no way to like get outside of the bounds because there's a monster inside that house. There's something horrible inside that house. The monster could be a supernatural monster, it could be an animal, it could be um, a serial killer, it could be all kinds of things, um, a f- supernatural force. And then there's a sin, and the sin usually brings about the monster. It kind of the the key thing with the sin is it's kind of the karma of the piece. It's why we kind of feel on edge that people might die because in some ways they deserve to die. Or somebody there there needs to be a blood atonement. And oftentimes the sin isn't something, oh, not often, but some of the time the sin isn't something the hero necessarily did. It could be the the world did it. You know, the the community did it. Somebody else did it. Um, and examples of sins that we we usually go through, if you listen to those other episodes, something like Alien, it might be the greed of sending the truckers to the planet, knowing that there's a problem there. It's kind of corporate greed is what brings about the mm-hmm. trouble. Jaws has a bit of greed as well, keeping the beaches open despite the shark. Um and then the classic one that I always bring up is Poltergeist. Um, the company uh, built the, the the real estate company or the building company built the community on top of a um, burial ground and just removed the the tombstones and built the houses yeah. on top. Left the so, bodies there, man. Left the bodies. So, um, 
and and those are the top three, and then we'll talk about the extra one, the half man, I guess, when we get to that. So do you want to yeah. talk about the first three? Uh, the first? house, the monster, and the sin. Yeah. So what are they in Barbarian? Well, house um, is, is, <laughs> is the house. Yeah, the house is the house. <laughs> yeah. The monster is um, an interesting discussion. Because, it is very interesting, right? Uh, yeah, like was, Frankenstein's monster, the the the, mo- the mother creature... It, you know, she's a monster by because of her situation, right? Like she's the daughter of a monster mm-hmm. who mm-hmm. like made her a mon who she is. It's like she really never had a chance to be anything else. And um, and she, Justin she, Long she, she is a was, monster. A, like he's yeah. a monster that meets another monster. Right. They're both inside the house. <laughs> but keep, <laughs> right? keep in mind the way I would think about the monster when you're right. coming up with your monster in the house. Who are you trying to run away from? Right, right. Yeah. And so it right. is the mom, you know. So even though, you know, Justin Long might be a monster, it's not like anybody's trying to run can, away can from I him. Say, right, right. Good way, like, good way to put it, Jamie. Like he's yeah. more like the thematic monster, maybe. Yeah, totally, than, totally. Than, yeah. Then she is yeah. the actual he's, monster. Right? W- when we're figuring out the sin, it's something about Justin Long's character. Yes. Right, yeah. Right. And and um, similarly, the and guy the, the dad. The yeah. dad in the bed. He's not really a threat to it. We can run away from him. He's yeah, easy that's to get away from. Good way to put He's it. He literally Jamie. just yeah. wants to die. He doesn't even yeah. pose a threat. Yeah. yeah. So, so, so when you're coming up with your elements, it has to be something that if you can get out of that, you're trying to get away from. Like if you stay in the house, that thing's going to get you. But if you yep. can, if you can get away from it, if you, it's chasing you. Here's the. Here's my. This is my weird take, and this kind of dabbles in the structure a little bit with this, but. I actually think this movie, because a lot of times when you're dealing with the monster in the house elements, it's how are you pitching the movie, right? We're not pitching the movie with Mother. We're pitching the movie with um, Skarsgård. He's the monster Mm -hmm. in some ways. So I actually think there's two two breakdowns of monster in the house in the story. There's the Airbnb (laughs) story, and then there's the surprise story with the monster in the back end. Mm -hmm. So I, Mm -hmm. I almost think there's two separate kind of one that's a trick it's a red herring story but we're basically playing into that and and the other is is the back end uh of the story so, so jamie do they have the same sin though that's the i don't think discussion. so no oh i don't i don't, think I, don't so. I don't think so and i think this is and again this gets into my structure thing i think he's just so let me let me just touch a little bit on the structure thing so the writer of this, the director of this, our our friend Zach, he actually said that he was writing the Airbnb movie. It was based on like something that kind of happened to him. Like he did a double booking and he got this idea and it was kind of a weird situation. And he started to write the story. And when he got to page 44, he was bored of it. He was like, what am I going to do? You know, Skarsgård's going to hide her in the basement and then they're going to do it. It's boring. I'm sick of this. So he just typed out, you know, barbarian woman charges out of the darkness and kills Skarsgård, you know, and then he was just in it. So he was kind of making it up as he went in some ways and he got bored halfway through. So I think that informs what this story is. I think, I think he had a plan going into the first half of the movie and then the plan completely changed in the second half of the movie. <laughs> that's my take on the movie. No, I think that's right. But yeah. When it comes to this, uh, we talk about the sin a little yeah, bit. Yeah, let's talk about the sin, because Bob. Go I, for it. Because I, I feel like, okay, even, uh, keeping in mind what Jamie said, I still think that he carries themes from that first yeah. movie that he got bored with to the second one. I, I it, agree. I and agree. it's very specifically in the first half, or not half, the first part, when Bill Skarsgård Scars, Scars and Tess have the art, when she basically confronts him, he's like about how the fact that he doesn't seem to, th- to understand how weird it is or how crazy it is for her to just trust him as a man and to come mm-hmm. into this Airbnb. He's a stranger. He's a man. And she's like, if it was the opposite, you wouldn't have thought twice about it. And you don't see why that's weird. You know, like she confronts mm-hmm. him about it. And I feel like that's in a weird way. We've talked about this before on the show, but you guys tell me if I'm wrong. But I almost felt like that moment is so classroom ish. For that's the go to theme. she actually says is that my lesson they they say those right, things right. those words right and right. and and he's like i don't know 
Right. He, <laughs> That's well, what he, he he's, says. He's not a. I mean, he turns out not to be a bad person, but his still no. obliviousness to his own. Uh, I'm gonna bring up bring up that thing I was talking about. Yeah, his own male do. entitlement. Mm-hmm. Um. So I. So like I was like you guys, like Jamie said with this movie, it's a really interesting discussion, and I'm not. I'm not gonna pretend like I watched this once and got the whole thing, J- Jimmy. You've already said you took yeah, you a no, couple times. Yeah, no, I didn't. Yeah. So I kind of looked. At, I kind of looked into it online, and there is a great article that I found called "The Horror Movie Barbarian Rules." Because massive spoilers ahead. That's what the title is. <laughs> it's it's on Polygon. If anyone wants to read it, um, and it basically talks about the movie's theme or the themes that run through it uh, are about male entitlement. And what tests, you know, and how basically it uh, causes everything in the movie. And the one sentence I wanted to read to you guys was this. Viewed through this lens, Barbarian becomes a film about how male entitlement and indifference has helped build a world that allows evil to fester and rot. Wow. And I, I, think I mean, that, that tracks. I mean, I think, right, that bingo. Uh, <laughs> I, I think that really tracks. And I needed I needed somebody else to put those words, because I saw it, I felt it. I just needed somebody else to put those words in my brain. <laughs> like, yeah, so so I, I think that's definitely, that's a great, um, that's a great theme. And I think, I think it is the overall theme. I sure, think, yeah. I think if we're just watching the beginning of the, of this movie, um, Let's say let's say the second half never happened, and there's some other movie. It's just a short mm-hmm. film that ends yeah. there, right? <laughs> yeah, something like you went in the basement, and he locked the door and locked her in, or so. Skarsgård did. Right. Um, at that point, it's like you could say the sin, but he's just the monster in some ways. So he is the sin. Yeah. It's like it's his, like his blaming aloofness to the reality goals. of it is the monster. Yeah. It makes him the monster. Yeah, like and I. So what I'm so what I was circling around. And I didn't have definitive, like, I don't know, right? I'm trying to get to... We're, we're all dudes that are like, we don't know. <laughs> no, but Airbnbs, right? So, right, so right. You, look at, you look at the concept itself. And what is the concept and how, what is a theme that is relevant to everyone who's, who would, exp, who would check, mm. check into, into an Airbnb? Yeah. What, is, what is the nightmare fuel, right, of, of checking into an Airbnb? That's what this is. This whole movie is an exploration of the nightmare scenario of checking into an Airbnb. What does that say? What is behind that? And I think that blind faith in yes. in comfort and safety yep. yes. is is really what I feel from start to finish. Like when, when anytime a character is behaving in a way that I feel is not human, which is a yes. problem I'm going to get to later. Mm-hmm. It's because they have blind faith in comfort and safety. Well, mm-hmm. even when Justin Long gets to the room with the serial killer in the bed, he actually assumes that guy is say is, is, is not going to harm him. He's like, Oh man, are you okay? Like he, he, it, it never comes to his mind that this guy might be a threat against him or be the reason for all of this. Right. Instead he has blind faith in comfort and safety. He raped that woman. We're gonna assume he raped his 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 lead actress, and he had blind they, they, he had blind yeah. faith in his comfort and safety of his of his like not. I'm not gonna get in trouble for that, right? So all these all these people are dealing with the horrors that come from blind faith in comfort and safety, but I don't know if that's what. But but that feels like it's missing that that gender balance i think that i think, that I think yeah. the gender thing is pretty important here and i do yeah. too i do especially too. considering well, mother is mother and right the, the, the whole the serial killer uh yeah thing of it all like my, yeah i'm missing the know. gender there when i'm my, doing right, this. right yeah right. My, and that's we're why we're acknowledging I, that we're three dudes too like my, <laughs> <laughs> that, that, that's it. why my thing is i think the beginning monster in the house like if i separate this into two movies and and then i think there's three movies there's the first movie, there's the second movie, <laughs> and there's the combined movie, right? Yeah, yeah. It's okay. like it's right. like all of that combined. But I think the first movie is operating on the blind faith thing and almost blaming Tess, right? Because mm-hmm. even though right. she's yes. acknowledging this stuff, she's yeah. going along with it. She's yeah. like, she's like, you know what? This situation is a horror movie, so, but I'm gonna yeah. slip here anyway. Can I say yeah, which I don't I don't believe, but anyway. I yeah. have a very, I have a very, uh, a very good lady friend who messaged me after watching this movie, and she said how she she did not enjoy it nearly as much as me, and I think it was a tonal problem too. But she basically said I would never go into that house. 
right and right. i would never go back into that house no, exactly. nothing on this earth could make me do that and i was like you're not wrong yeah. it's like you said like the the whole decision of it is doesn't read well with uh with a very for a pragmatic audience it doesn't make sense mm -hmm. but then it's like i kind of pulled in the tonal thing like you kind of yeah. have, yeah. have the characters do this yeah i have no some movie it's it's right one and of those that's things... i have some thoughts on that i kind of want to yeah. save to the end but... sure yeah. sure yeah it, it's it's but one was, of those i got perspective it's one of those... from someone else about it that's what i was saying it's one of those weird things where that's where the the evil comedian is coming in i think <laughs> he's like i'm gonna put her back in that house anyway because yeah, i'm gonna screw with you guys man. Yeah, right. you you wouldn't go back in that house, but I'm sending her in that basement. You know, <laughs> she's gonna go in that room. She's gonna check out. You know, um, and I I do think there's some screwing around with you stuff there. Um, that's that's messing with you that he keeps piling on. Most people wouldn't walk into the Airbnb. They would, you know, <laughs> they would drive out of that yeah. neighborhood completely. So so I think it operates like when we're watching that first half, we know it's a dangerous world. We know how horrible you know, men can be, we know she's in a vulnerable position and she keeps, there's all these red flags that keep coming up, which I talk about a red flag resume a little later that he brought up. Um, and even though she ticks off a lot of them and it, you could see her seeing them, she continues in anyway. And the reason I don't think that's, he's trying to teach us a lesson, like, you know, thematically. Yeah. Yeah. Like women need to, uh, no, no. Watch out for these that. red flags. No, I think it still operates on us like a 1980s horror movie where that might be the lesson. Like, don't have sex or you'll get killed. It's a much more um, conservative lesson <laughs> in yeah. the 80s than in here. He's not doing that. Right. Right. Yeah. Right. But I do think it still operates on that. I still think we're saying, oh, she's stupid. She deserves what she gets. You know, I mean, uh, oh, blind, my God. Well, that's, blind that's, comfort that's, and that's that's blind why faith and comfort and safety. That's why yeah. the lesson lines happen very specifically to to show that it's on him not her yeah right mm -hmm. he's he's committing the sin by not realizing what she's trusting that's a good point bob you yes. know what i'm saying like that's why yes. those lines are she there. is pointing out his entire his male entitlement the title there. Man right there yes right. yeah but, that's that's but, true but, but only in retrospect is that happening like yeah if if this movie were the peter sarsgaard movie who cares if he ignores it? he's a killer he's gonna trap right. her in the base true right, right. um you're right so that's what i'm saying that's where it doesn't I think it's a there's a red herring of this one movie where Skarsgård is the monster, and then that's where we get the third movie where what you're saying is true, where his 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 ignorance of it is culpable in the in the overall problem. So that's why I'm saying that it's like three different. There's a red herring movie that's yeah. very basic, and it's girl doing <laughs> stupid things gets what she deserves in some ways. Um, there's there's the Which second isn't what movie. The movie's saying but no, no yeah, not that, at all yeah. that's 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 why it's called the red herring movie right right um it's the fake um then there's the second movie where it's justin long commits in my opinion commits a sin a horrible sin doesn't learn the lesson ends up dying for it mm -hmm. that's yep. that's the second yep. movie and then there's a third movie which i think is bob i think what you're summing up which makes scars guard culpable because he's not a villain he's a hero so he can have culpability if he's a monster eh, his sin who cares is a monster right right um but it now that we know he's not a monster we see where his sin works so anyway that's where it's kind of complex in some ways in my yeah, it's it's a it's a weird it's a weird take on the whole thing i mean also like the themes of th that male entitlement reach out to how the monster was created i mean yep how the right? monster was how the serial killer was Ser able to do what he did you and know that's control, very capturing that's, controlling raping women and raising them as his own that's, that tracks yeah that's, that's like the extreme very example he's on one end if you want to talk about a tonal that is scale the of sin that created this whole situation right. but the, i'm yeah. saying like like you have scars guard on one end who just is aloof to that existing and then you have one guy who's absolutely abusing it in the most horrific way possible mm -hmm. on the other one right all in one yep. movie there, yep. there was one other aspect though that muddied the works for me a little bit with this mm -hmm. i think i think what we just discussed is really the right direction so now i'm going to throw a curveball go for it <laughs> <laughs> there seems like there seems like something also at play with the neighborhood mm -hmm. as a yeah. sin right the the neighborhood collapse it was a nice people are moving out 
Is it is there racism angle it, there? I, is there? I was going to say, going Jamie, do, do you think that's another like thematic red herring there? Like I've kind of felt like that a little bit. Like it, it's not. It, it could be say it, anything about it, really. It it doesn't really. I yeah. can't. I, I can't. I can't help but think it's there because it hits. They hit it a couple times. Like they hit it in the beginning. Like you stay in that neighborhood, and then she yeah. Sees but the, the thing is, they, yeah. it's to, to this point. Like I actually think like if you rewatch it the way it's it's and i'm sure this is on the page too the way it's shot it appears to be a nice neighborhood in the in the in the storm and it's only when he says uh have you seen it out there you shouldn't be going out there but like when she looks around when she's outside in the dark it doesn't look scary they all look like normal houses it isn't until she comes outside in the day that she's freaked out and and we're like wait this this neighborhood doesn't look like i she perceived and we perceived in that first right. section. I think that's very deliberate. I don't know what that says. It speaks again to the, for me, like the blind faith that this was a nice neighborhood. You know, she didn't even like get a closer look at all those houses. It, she just like, is yeah. it possible? It's not saying anything as much as it is functional to the story of there can't be people living all around that house for this to work. Yeah, it's right. It, you know what I mean? Like it, it has to be by itself. And it, yeah, I, I think that is what it is. But the only thing that throws me off a little bit is when they go to the flashback, they make another point of mentioning like, they, yeah, he's they like, never, I'm staying. This you know? is like, this house. Yeah. This, this neighborhood's going to hell. Yeah. That, that sends my mind and they're in Detroit, which, which is, made me laugh know, by the way. <laughs> yeah. And, and it would just, it just sends me off in this, this, it, um, it makes by, by the way, didn't hurt the story at all no no it, no I, I just for this for the purpose of this podcast like i'm like what was he saying what was he trying to there? say all that stuff and also but, i think that the one thing you know i haven't seen talked about much is just like what it makes me laugh is how did this all get to where it is now how did that become an airbnb <laughs> like they don't it does, i don't need that answered for me that's almost the 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 magic of the movie like i uh, don't right. explain how yeah. well, there, there's but... a massive off-screen movie there's so yeah like how did yes. it get all here who is yeah. actually in the know about what's happening right the... are the people who are running the real estate they understand that occasionally some of their people go missing and they just figure right. out a way to manipulate the system so that they keep making money right yeah like what's how, ha- how what's is happening how are two people renting that house and it's not getting like, is, are they the first renters? Because wouldn't they get a very low rating on the Airbnb? System? <laughs> right, right. Well, they're manipulating the numbers. Yeah. It's all. Poor reviews. Yeah. 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 See all this. Our imagination goes wild. That's good. That's. Yeah. <laughs> that's that's uh, good. Well, that speaks to its strength. The So the half man. Uh, I guess it's pretty obvious who the half man is. In yeah. The movie, so the right? half man, Jamie, you want to m- remind the people what yeah. a half man is? Well, what that and, means? Yeah, yeah. It's it's interesting too because I did a blog recently and somebody had a question about the half man. They were a little confused, and I referenced this podcast, so maybe they'll listen to this episode and hear it. <laughs> um, because uh, I I couldn't figure out WordPress to <laughs> make a comment back to them. Uh, so so anyway, the half man. The half man is a character that's usually had an encounter with the monster, survived the monster in some way, in some fashion. They've they've they sort of tasted the monster's evil in some ways, and they're half a person for it. Sometimes literally, sometimes scarred, sometimes you know just scared or whatever. They've had that experience, and usually they they kind of come in the middle of the movie. They're not they're they're almost like a mentor character of sorts, and they usually can provide a way of surviving, destroying outwitting the beast because they've had that experience so and some so, and and when sometimes we've found in can, like a movie like Candyman, sometimes they they're subverted and they are helping the monster there's you know ash and alien is a monster you know is a monster helper uh renfield is a monster helper in the new Candyman reboot it's revealed that the guy's been helping the, the main the, character the whole time is actually a monster helper and the classic yeah. one would be Quint in Jaws, who's faced, you know, who survived this horrible shark attack and has the scars, you know. I was going to say, like, with that, it's usually the character that gives the praise of killer speech that the praise of the that, killer that, speech, that, which that, yeah, that lets the audience know what how dangerous is the thing we're dealing with. Like, <laughs> yeah, that, that, you know, in this case, it would be the the. uh I guess the guy living in the water tower, right? Mm-hmm. Like yes. That's, yes. That's, he's the half man. 
And then what's interesting is that Tess then becomes, she becomes that role as well for, for AJ, right. you know? Right. So within the, within the timeline of the movie, which I think is unconventional and another different thing this movie mm-hmm. does, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> Once again, too, one of the funniest things in the movie to me is the half man's death in this movie. It's yeah, just, it's, I mean, it's, it's deep blue sea, dude. Yeah, you um, can't not watch that and not <laughs> realize it's trying to be funny. <laughs> I laughed. <so. laughs> yeah, it's really funny, man. But, yeah. By the way, his speech, you know, the clone of the clone of the clone oh, the or clone. whatever. That copy thing. of the copy of the copy. A, a copy of the copy. That was apparently an ADR speech. So they decided oh, wow. after the fact. I love after, it. I love it. And people, I'm sure people were like, how do we explain this monster and why they're the way they are and you know how messed up mm-hmm. they are? So they threw in a little half man speech there as an That's why we treat the final edit as a script. Yeah. That's right. That's right. Right, because if you just read the script, that wouldn't be in there. That wouldn't be there. So like they're continuing to rewrite. AD, ADR, the ADR, by the way, just for anybody who doesn't know, is dialogue that you put in after the movie is already made. So it's usually like you find a shot where their lips aren't moving or from behind or you do something <laughs> yep. else. And then somebody comes in after the movie, talks into a microphone and gives a little speech. That's where and you had jokes. Yes. <laughs> yes. yes. And, and to the extreme, the Northman episode, we learned that the entire movie is ADR'd in, in right. English because it was shot, written and shot in Norse language. It, so. It's, it's, it's <laughs> and very it's CGI. They CGI their mouths. It's to, just crazy. It's yeah. very common for when you get notes from either a test screening or just producer notes. It, it you know the notes never stop when you're a screenwriter in some ways or a director, and the same things that come up before you make the movie come up like. Uh, you know, these logic questions and stuff and the clarity questions and who is this thing and do people care and stuff like that. And sometimes for clarity, I find more ADR stuff comes about clarity. Like I didn't understand who she was or something like that. Mm-hmm. So they're like, oh, I know how we can answer that. You know, that little scene in the fire where he talks about what his favorite coffee is. We'll change that to being about the clone of the clone of the clone. And- and the, and they'll do something like that. Talks about his favorite yeah. coffee. coffee. Yeah, exactly. That would, be, that would be so funny if that's what he's talking about. <laughs> Where he's got a bullet hole and he's like, you know, what my favorite, favorite coffee, coffee is. is? <laughs> we, I, I even seen it exists. I think <laughs> there was some scene in exists that we ADR just like this. It was almost the same thing. It was like, oh, do I? I was like, ah, we don't need a backstory of like the history of or something and there there was a whole speech i had to write for adr in the back end that was very similar for clarity of this and for clarity of why they're like where how the cabin was there and how they is that where she talks they talk about like the bigfoot's children being having a yeah i don't remember no no it's more it's more something i i don't i barely remember but it's more (laughs) like it's more like the one of the main characters history with the with the cabin gotcha gotcha creatures. okay yeah gotcha. and it was it was very similar to what and uh, yeah do you think it, it happens all the time like with something like this where he does the copy uh, the adr for the copy of the copy of the copy thing like it also it's not ju- i don't think it's always just studio notes like it actually makes the it makes the audience watching it for the first time stop questioning what she is and just go with the rest of the movie mm-hmm. to some degree like yeah okay, it, ma- it makes that, that know, climax land harder yeah right. well, now that uh, i yeah. know i can just go with it, how it's going uh, honestly it usually comes from test screenings that's where 90 yeah, yeah, 90 percent of this adr yeah. stuff so they'd be like you know was there anything you had questions about they'll be like i didn't understand who was this why was she like that I, yeah, why that's... was she messed up did she was she a mutant you know and they'll be like oh they don't understand i thought everybody would understand that she was mm-hmm. just you know this baby that was raised beneath the thing and so then they have to give an answer usually that's what happens right right yeah um we kind of you kind of touched on it jamie but you really want structure was i think the biggest thing you wanted to talk about with this movie right yeah yeah and i i've been jumping back and forth through it so i'll kind of talk a little bit about it it's it's funny because in his interviews he said like save the cat does not apply to this movie like he said that (laughs) Like in, in, in response said, to screw Jamie Nash. Oh yeah. shit! <laughs> Shots fired. Exactly. And 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 uh, he said, and that 
that stupid book about the TV stuff, <laughs> no, no, um, which is but, available on Amazon. Yeah, no, and, and that Raiders Blockbusters podcast that is crap. I gave Fuck it one. Those star. guys. I gave it one star, but it was on the old site, so Dude. you wouldn't see the review on the Apple. <laughs> I'd, I'd just be happy that one of the whitest kids you know was talking about me. Yeah. He said, "Never <laughs> listen to this podcast. It sucks." Um, so. The, he he actually said in his interview, say the cat, and he wasn't really being negative. He was just saying, "I'm making a movie that this is different. I'm trying to be different. I'm trying to do something different." But here's the interesting thing about it: I think, I think it works because of Save the Cat. I think that's exactly it. I think cheeseburgers work because of Save the Cat. So he knows you're a cheeseburger fan. He's giving you the cheeseburger, and then he's surprising you with the sauce in the middle. So he's actually taking the structure you're used to and giving you a big surprise in the middle. Subverting the it save is, the cat. Yeah. Exactly. Which is what a comedian would do, right? Yes. <laughs> yeah. He's giving you the surprise. His save the cat is the setup to the punchline of oh, this isn't the movie you so think. So it's it dependent is. upon our knowledge of what our, our is. you know, our expectations of that experience. Right. Which is very different than a mini plot movie. Which is like mm -hmm. screw save the cat. My characters don't have goals; they're just out there. I have ten characters. There's no obstacles. There's no conflict. That's what a mini plot movie does, or like, an anti plot. Where I, or an anti -plot. Watched, I watched a film once that is a fly on a wall. Yes, and that's the whole thing for yeah. for like a half an hour. Yeah, it's like like it's an like, Andy Warhol movie of somebody eating a bowl right. of soup. Right. So it's like just, it, narrative yeah. doesn't exist. Like right. during yep. your. They're your non cheeseburger movies where Save the Cat does not apply or Save the Cat only can barely be seen. Not a great um, podcast to talk about those. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, <laughs> you, you got to talk about different things. You got to. They have their merits. They yeah. Have, oh, yeah. No, I'm not discounting yeah, yeah. merit. I'm just saying. Yeah. The, to talk about them at length would be odd. Is this, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, I don't know. Actually, actually, those, those, Probably you could talk about length because they're really hard to decipher. Decipher sometimes. what's what does and it that, mean? What is it going? Sometimes on? that's what people are chasing with them is they want to think really hard on them, and I get that because uh, they <laughs> totally. are hard. They're not they're not a cheeseburger. You're trying to figure out what am I eating um, in some ways. Yeah. Like, what why is does it, it taste so good? Why, why is it why, why is it yeah. salty and sweet? I don't yeah. Get it. <laughs> how, how is this working? How is this working? It's not like anything mm -hmm. I know. So um so anyway, I do think save the cat applies. And one thing, so I think you can break, break the first half into like a, a, uh, almost like a, a, a first act structure. It's almost like a long, slow burn first act, right? Big Where, setup. Yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like a big setup. It, it could, it could even, I didn't do the analysis of it, but it could even be like a setup plus a little bit of fun and games. Like once she's there and she goes back maybe, but I, I, I feel like it's more like a first act. Like we're just about mm -hmm. to get to the fun and games. And that's when the monster jumps out. The second movie, the Justin Long movie, I think it breaks into a save the cat structure. I mean, I think you could say um, his setup is him, you know, his setup is him uh, driving in the car and learning about him. Mm -hmm. And we learn about his flaw and his problem I mean, and stuff like him that. Singing his car, things he, that need fixing. I was going to yeah. say things that need uh, fixing. him singing in the car right before he gets the phone call is his before world, right? Yep. That so, is and, his and, before and, world. Yep. And, right. And then he, <laughs> and it all goes away. There's a, there's a catalyst. So we set up all the things that need fixing and stuff like that. There's a catalyst when he discovers the hidden tunnel. There's a debate section when he's measuring it and figuring it mm -hmm. all out. The biggest um, laugh in the movie. That's what I was talking yeah. about. Yeah. When the, <laughs> when the monster attacks, we're in a break into a two. Now he has a goal, mm -hmm. you know, escape from the prison of the monster. Mm -hmm. um, there's an obstacle in the way. The monster's in the way. It's it's its own monster in the house. There's even a B story at that moment. There's a B story flashback, which goes to the flashback of the history of the house and stuff like mm -hmm. that, which informs. Um, th then, you know, the funny games is kind of about the escape and the mother and all that stuff and, and the things that happen there. Um, maybe getting out is the midpoint but it's a it's kind of a false midpoint and uh and the all is lost you know it's all there it is my point is it follows the save the cat structure so when he says save the cat structure doesn't apply he's hitting the beats as it goes it even has a character arc in this case it's a tragic character arc where it's a hero that the lesson is right in front of them we see them struggling with being a good person 
but they don't learn. They push her off the end. And because of that, he dies for it. So that's why it's a tragic ending. He doesn't learn the arc mm -hmm. and he ends up paying the price. So it has a classic save the cat structure. It's just how you parse it. When you have an anthology or anything like that, the reason you can't do a save the cat structure for pulp fiction is because it's four stories you have to do save the cat structures for. It's not one. Yeah, they all have their own individual structures. Yeah. They all have their own structures and they're and all we, scattered and interwoven. So Yeah, and we I, I remember we we came to the conclusion that that it was nonlinear because the way that it was told nonlinearly proved explored the theme to its end. And the right. showed that, you know, showed the character growth in a way that if you had told it linearly, it wouldn't hit that way. Right. So, right. Yeah. And I and I think this kind of fake out, uh, you know, let's switch the movie at midpoint kind of thing. We've seen it in Psycho Audition. You know, there, mm -hmm. there's some movies that kind of do this fake out thing. And false protagonist. False protagonist. Yep. 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 Yeah. What, so but then it's, then it's there? then it's then uh, it's. Mm, not not really, false protagonist, but false yeah. genre. Yeah. Um. But but no, the and psych. It's a dual. Like that's why I was like, no, it's not false protagonist. It's a dual protagonist. And then it's like, but wait, he's actually a bad guy. <laughs> like, so the, playing with those expectations. This is a real. This is a real good movie to remind everyone that protagonist doesn't mean good. Doesn't mean hero necessarily. Right. You know. Right. I mean? That's like, yes. Thank it, it might you, be Bob. Justin, it might be Justin oh, yeah. Long's movie, but he is a bad person. He's yeah. A bad guy. So, yes. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Save the cat use, uses hero because people get protagonist confused, and it does cause confusion because it people says are, pro on it. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. I, um, I had a, a consultation uh, this week where somebody somebody was like trying to figure out who their hero was. And there was some character that did, had a heroic moment for a very small period of the film. So they were like, that's my hero. And I was like, well, they only, they're only in like 10% of the movie. That's yeah. But, but somehow they were thrown off by the word hero and it totally messed them up. Right. right. Um, so anyway, when, if you see a save the cat, when I say the hero of your story, the you hero of the story yeah. could be horrible. It's, it's <laughs> who we're following, who we're, who were tracking, who were seeing it through their POV. And I saw some reactions to this movie of people who aren't as akin to that concept where the main character has to be someone they can identify with. And I'm like, this, no, it's mm. not, <laughs> that's not your movie for you. No. If you, if you require that. <laughs> it's, he, he, I want, yeah. It's weird though, because of Justin Long, like you don't loathe that character. You realize it's There's, Justin Long it's playing a meta that casting character. thing. I think a yeah. little bit. Mm -hmm. he, he takes the edge off because he's Justin Long. You're you're enjoying like his bumbling, goofy ways, even though he's this horrible person. And so yeah, ways. it reminds me a lot of the William H Macy in Fargo. Like right, he's, right. like that guy sucks, but yeah, but yeah, but but he's an, entertaining. He he's endearing because he's William H Macy. You just love it's to right. watch him. And, yeah. Give him a hug. It, in the same way, I feel like Justin Long and I are on board. Like we're on the late wavelength. Like, yay! I'm not really this guy, but I'm playing him, so you can laugh. Kind of thing. Right, right, right. There's right. something. Yeah. There's something strange like, about it. There's. It's. It's not a wink, but no. we kind of know how Justin Long would feel in real life. <laughs> right in real life. Right. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. I wanted to mention before we forget, and we can, because we have done structure at length now. But uh, I think this is, movie is a great example of of uh, the technique of why here, why now. Um, and I just wanted to briefly discuss it from both characters, and it sort of speaks to what you're saying, Jamie, that it does, even though it it it, it takes things a little out of order. The structure is still built upon really solid um construction of of a concept and so like um when you're when you're coming up with a litmus test for whether you're like your concept your log line your just premise is ready to ready to go and 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 solid enough to be written one thing to think about is the concept of why here why now this is a david mamet concept that that he did in what was it the unit it, there's a very famous memo he sent out to his writing staff that he was a total asshole in and basically was giving them a set of he was micromanaging the the writers of the unit and he included on this memo this concept of like like every scene should ha have a clear uh a clear uh answer to why this story has to happen here and why this story has to happen now but that concept 
extends to the movie itself. And I use it to help my clients really bulletproof their story concepts in general. And if you can come up with uh, a concept, so where a situation where the story can't happen anywhere else, it has to happen here. And if you can come up with a, a, that with that same uh, idea for the story has to happen now at this time in the timeline, in the story world timeline, in the characters timeline, then it's going to create this insane built in urgency for what's happening in the story. It's like it, it immediately creates like tension and urgency and ticking clocks. All those things happen if you can rock, come up with a rock solid why here, why now. And Tess has a great why here, why now. And it changes and she has another one. So like her her original why here, why now is that she's staying in an Airbnb that's close to Detroit and she's got to stay in this like outskirts of Detroit because she's struggling financially. Right. And, and the she's why for a job, right? The why now is she has a job interview tomorrow. Right. So those are very specific, clear. Why here? Why now answers for why this the story is happening. And they make they create built in urgency immediately. And then when she's like finds out about the double booking. There's another why here, why now, which is she's trying to get a hotel and she can't get a hotel because right now and right here, there's a convention, there's a convention going on. And so here there's a convention going on and now like there all the hotels are booked so she can't get a place anywhere else even when she's trying to leave the situation so it's a great example of why here right now and then aj has a great why here right why now for his own story right why why here he's coming to his airbnb why now because he's been charged with sexual misconduct and he needs to raise $140,000 for the legal fees. So he needs right, to get right. rid of this house. So that is a very clear, like defined why here, why now in the construction that creates urgency that cannot be denied for the situation. So it's just, if you're, if you're trying to learn how to, um, what, what is the concept of why here, why now? I think both of those characters' situations um, are great learning, great teaching examples. So I, I, just, I, I like that you're pulling good teaching examples from a movie <laughs> that we kind of were like a little bit like, this might not be a teaching movie. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, I took a bunch of topic, talking points off of it where I was trying to take the good because I think, I think the character introductions are like, really instructive because we're meeting right, characters right. We're there. We're meeting characters in it's the anti breakfast scene for all of them. We're meeting characters in the middle of like insane conflicts. And when you put it, when you meet a character, when they're forced with it, like real with conflicts that are high stakes and they make choices, it really tells you who the character is very quickly. Um, and both of the, both, both Tess's character introductions, I think are really instructive in, in how they show you who the character is through the situation that's unfolding and the choices they make in that situation. Like like right, AJ's right. on the phone in the car, like, fuck that bitch. You know, he's yeah, right. he's completely dismissive of the of the horrible uh, thing he's being of the horrible being, thing yeah. he's being he's all he's all, he's all there, there's a story about me. I, I, that struck yeah. me when he didn't say her, like, there's a story about me coming. Like yeah, it, yeah. It, 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 it defines his character so quickly. And it's, a, they're just both character introductions. They're great, great, instructive, great craft to learn from. So, yeah. Um, what I was going to what I was going to say about the structure too, there's one thing, there's something cool about the structure, but there's also something dangerous about the structure. So I want to kind of just quickly mention. Yeah. That. Let's sure, do yeah, that. Yeah. So, so the cool thing in a spec script, especially one where you, um, you're sending it out to somebody who reads hundreds and hundreds of scripts um, and is trying to look for the next cool thing. Um, if you do this midpoint twist, they might they might be way ahead of you with this other Airbnb movie and be like, you know, this is pretty good, but let's see how it pays off. And then the midpoint twist might throw them for such a loop that it kind of wakes them up and they're like, this is interesting. This is different than the other stack of scripts I get. Right. And, you know, uh, may, maybe barbarian will cause so many of these scripts that that this trick will be gone for a little while like this <laughs> there's a reason why every movie doesn't do this trick because it's kind of like once you know m night has a twist in the end 
it starts losing its cool after about four movies, you know? So if every, if you see a bunch of movies with the same kind of gag, it's kind of like, okay, we, we get it. We've seen that. They're trying to do the barbarian thing is basically, it's kind of its own mental <laughs> real estate at that point. Yeah. So, so just be cautious with that, but that's kind of what's at play here. Like if you, you know, there is something to it. There's a stunt aspect to doing this that might wake somebody up if you execute things really well. Now, here's the dangerous part. And by the way, Stephen King, uh, before I get to the dangerous part, Stephen King, he's a pantser, which means he doesn't really outline. He just writes. He thinks about it and writes. And he kind of writes like, what do I want to see? What would surprise me? How would I react? And I think that's how this script came about, is the writer was just no outline, just writing and trying to figure out like what they'd be interested in. Well, I'm not a fan of that. And I've done that in the early days because I realize outlining is really the same thing, just in a better way. Like, uh, honestly, you can outline the same way. You can ask yourself, Pantsing. what, yeah, measure, what would... measure twice, cut once? Yeah, it's it's just, <laughs> it, it, screenwriting is just a, a, a wordier way of outlining. So just do the less wordy way, is my opinion. <laughs> um, but anyway, that, that's teach that's their own comment. though. <laughs> teach their own. If, yeah. Some people, some people just, just can't. Him, right. So yeah, some people just can't get into the outline, and they can't get, they can't feel the characters, they can't get the group. There's a certain like channeling, like some vibe you need to get. And I get that sometimes you can't get that with the outline. So sometimes you just need to pants it a little bit. So Stephen King writes that way. And 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 that's a good way always to think about like what'll surprise you. What's the next thing I want to see? Whether you're pantsing or outlining, that's a good lesson to learn. Um, here's the dangerous thing about this movie, taking this movie as a um as an example or just inspiration. Yeah. Or inspiration. The dangerous thing is one of the most common, common things I see in new screenwriters, people that have written maybe under three scripts, I will call them new screenwriters, is they often get bored of their high concepts halfway, sometimes even sooner. Sometimes they get bored by act one and they just shift to a different concept. They abandon the abandon premise. the whole thing, the whole premise. So imagine if you came up with Jurassic Park and by the midpoint, you're like, I don't know what to do with this. This is getting boring to me. I'm going to make it about a UFO and it comes down because they kind of literally of... did that with the last Jurassic world movie. It was about bugs. <laughs> Thanks for spoiling <laughs> it, man. I, didn't spoil it. <laughs> I was going to watch it tonight too. That's Are you serious? Gonna... Yeah. Thanks, man. No, oh, just uh, okay. I mean, I don't... Jamie, I can't tell with you sometimes. <laughs> 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 because like, that's the movie I was going to watch tonight. <laughs> nice. Come on. Um, so, uh, so and so anyway, just I can't tell you how many times I've seen new writers hunt their premise. Um, it's a very common thing. It's almost like because one of the things I always say new writers have to learn is how to finish. But I think they also have to learn how to stick with their story that brought them to the dance as opposed yeah, to like I have, I have a friend that calls that the false start. Okay. Um, because there's a whole movie that happens and then that's not actually the movie. And then there's a second movie that happens. And, and, and I, I do think you're, I think people would misunderstand and think that this is doing a false start when it's not, you know, it's all relevant. It's all I, cohesive. Yeah, I, was, I was about to say, I was about to argue the same thing. I was going to yeah, say, yeah. It, like, it's but, not but completely the, in left field. There when is when, some, when yeah. movies come out like this and they're successful and they're well-received and they do weird things, people take the wrong lessons from them. And that's, that's like, nope. it, it's, this isn't a false start. This is a, a an actual setup for a cohesive nope. end. Nope. Though I will say it might have gotten there, but the way he describes it is it is exactly the false start. He got to the middle of his Airbnb movie and was like, I'm doing something else because I'm not I'm not going to go through with the Airbnb movie. And I, honestly, that happens more often when you don't outline than when you do, because when you do outline, you agonize over it. And you're like, well, how do I make the Airbnb movie interesting? And you keep going and going, which he might have gotten to if you were at 50 drafts. Mm -hmm. He got to that point pantsing it. And said, you know what? Monster charges out of the out of the darkness. Yeah, false start. Okay, Punted. so I'm, I'm yeah, I'm wrong his, there. His, his is a false start. Now he may have redrafted it 50 times and been like, I'm on to something cool here with this false start. And maybe you'll be on to something cool, you people out there that are gonna do this. But just know that I've seen this go wrong so many times. Um, and it it really isn't a good idea. You 
if you're coming up with concepts that you get bored of at the 50 minute mark, then that's come up with a different concept. That's what I'm saying. Nine times out of 10, <laughs> come up with a different concept. Now, when you come up with Proceed the concept- Proceed with caution. <laughs> yeah. yeah may, maybe you came up with the concept of a uh, creepy barbarian lady in the basement of an Airbnb. And this is the way you told it. That's fine. I'm just worried that you came up with, I'm, I had this great idea for an Airbnb movie. And then halfway through, you're like, I'm bored of that. I'm doing this other but you, thing. Like, you mean like they were going to tell a ghost story and it, it changed to this. And they changed because they're like, yeah. I, I don't want to write a ghost story. I can't, I don't have enough <laughs> ideas for a ghost story. So I'm going to go with a UFO story or a serial killer <laughs> story. Um, you know, so it's just be cautious of it. If if the reason you're doing it or, or just be, I, I don't know. It's just one of these things that when you come up with a good premise, make that the story. Don't, don't tag that story out halfway through because you can't <laughs> I, figure it out. I was going like, to say, we kind of talked about it already, but the way you can tell this happened, like you're saying, Jamie, is because of all the questions we have with how it became an Airbnb that was completely <laughs> abandoned. Like, they never, yeah. were never answered. Like, he obviously doesn't care. It just is like that. But I think if he stuck with it, that might have been something he would address maybe with ADR. <laughs> you know what I mean? right, you know, right. you know, but you know what I mean? Like it would have been addressed more about how, why this is a functioning Airbnb with all this stuff happening in the basement. I I, I know? just wish I just wish I thought it would be great if Conan the Barbarian was living in the basement. And this I mean, is some barbarian kind of too, man. More, yeah. Get Arnold in there. That would, you know? I mean, how awesome would it be if, if Arnold had charged out of there like in his costume and the sword and he's like Kill you or something, you know. That would enough, have been, enough Jamie, talking. that would have been a total <laughs> whiplash if there ever was one. By <laughs> Crom, you die. Yeah. You know. <laughs> quite <laughs> quite the tone there, sir. Yes. Um uh you talked a little bit about the red flag resume. Yeah, you want to expand a, on that a little bit, new, Jamie? Is, a, is this a new Jamie Nash yeah. idea? This is a new uh a so new this this actually comes from the director, but I was wondering if there isn't something to this that might be, I'm almost planting a seed in case we ever see this again. Right. Um, but he said that he read a book called The Gift of Fear by security consultant Gavin De Becker. Okay. Okay. And it was a thing where there was a bunch of red flags, like yeah, right. about, good. yeah, about women, um, you know, these things that she's seeing in the Airbnb were basically this book outlined a bunch of those things. And they were things like complimenting you when it's not necessarily appropriate or or doing you a favor that you didn't ask for or touching in a non-sexual way that's not initi initiated. So there were all these things, those things that we talked about that the Scars Guys character doesn't realize, but the woman kind of does realize. But what it I, I almost think there might be a thing in horror movies. And this, this is a dread tool where maybe this red flag checklist is a dread tool. You know what I mean? Because mm -hmm. in, in movies, a lot of times the main character isn't seeing the red flags, or maybe they are a little bit, but we as the audience are checking the boxes. Uh-oh, mm -hmm. you know, creepy uh, this. Uh, or, I like it, Jamie. Solid. And I yeah. just, when I when I heard him talk about this, I'm like, this, you know, because we talk about dread a lot and, and, and dread is... Um, now I have to explain dread. Damn it. Uh, <laughs> we, we talk about the three types of horror. urban. That's dread right there. The, the, the tr three types of horror. I pulled Jamie's um, string. Let's go. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. So three types of horror, just super quick. And, and this kind of is paraphrasing a Stephen King thing. Um, there's, there's the dread that there's some uneasiness, some buildup. There's some uh, feeling that something bad's about to happen. That's dread. Right. And then there's terror, which is like something jumping out at you. It's like the jump scare. It's like the immediate scary thing that that, you know, you scream at ah, and, and you run. And it's that that's the terror. And then there's the gross out. He talks about the gross out, which is the gore, the thing that turns your stomach that revolts you. I mean, this movie has pieces of all of those, it, you know, the the. The, the feeding the baby stuff would be the gross out. The terror is mm -hmm. the monster running out. Jumping and out, the, yeah. And the dread is the slow buildup, like like him with the uh with the measuring tape and stuff like that. And then the dark we know something's gonna happen and we're Walking waiting backwards waiting, waiting down it. that hallway. Right. Walking <laughs> backwards. Yeah. So so I, I just wonder the the problem with dread is I always say 
whenever I talk about horror writing, I say, don't sleep on the dread. Like too many yeah. writers don't know how to do dread. And I was kind of, I, I've always been like, well, that's an easy thing to say, but how do I teach that? And when I saw this red flag thing, I kind of, I kind of marked it off. I checked it off. Maybe there's a thing I elaborate on in horror in the future, this red flag uh, resume sort of thing or checklist. And, and we could just, the red flag is is something we notch as a viewer that is increasing dread in us. So anyway. I love it. I love okay. it. I love it. We're That's great. Maybe we'll re we'll bring it up again and we'll expand on it. This will be fun. <laughs> That's yeah, great. yeah, yeah. Yep. So yeah. There you go. That's my red flags. It feels like it it, it it leads into rooting resume. That's issues, why right? I put it there. Yeah. yeah. So so something I noticed. So we just did the Hellraiser reboot, and we did we tried to. Um, figure out why we weren't like super engaged with the main character and we did her rooting resume and a lot of the typical things you want to explain a rooting resume jamie and then i'll <laughs> bounce off of it <laughs> sure sure so um you know it's the same it's funny Line them up. it's got it's funny to, to describe rooting resume i always describe save the cat too so now i got a twofer um so <laughs> save the cat refers to how you have a horrible character, but if they could do one good thing, like or they don't have to be horrible, but but they could be horrible. It could be a Justin Long type character. But if they do one good thing, one redeeming value, one thing to get us on their side, then we'll be on their side uh, throughout the movie. And, and something like saving a little poor kitty cat or something could be it. And that's a save the cat moment. I've expanded that in my own way because I always think save the cat's limiting I think there's a lot of, I think a rooting resume, your whole first 10 pages of a feature um, is about establishing why we need to root for somebody. And it could be anything from, from uh, that they're funny, they're likable to they're good at something. It could be, it could be things like saving a cat or being nice to someone. Nice to kids. Um, kids nice like to kids. Them. Yeah. So there's, there's all kinds of. The, one of the big things is making them an underdog is is often a thing. If somebody's an underdog, if there's things that the world's kind of being crappy to them, if they're in a dangerous situation, if they're in an unfair situation, these are all reasons we naturally root for someone as an audience. So that's what a and, rooting resume and, is. And we've given examples where that it doesn't mean that the character has to be likable. It just need, means they need to be, we need to be able to connect with them and understand them. And like, for example, in the Joker episode, we found uh, we found 15 rooting techniques in the first 10 pages of Joker, which right. speaks to why it's such an interesting character. Right. Uh, despite how bad of a person he is. And right. Right. And uh, but so so uh, in the Hellraiser episode and we've talked about how like we've broken down villains like Biff and Hans Gruber using these root this rooting resumes. And then you can inverse a few key rooting resumes and make them the opposite like it like the gremlins instead of loving animals they hate animals right so it's like you you can inverse select you you can use the same techniques with making compelling villains um but what we found in the hellraiser episode is the main character had a lot of inverses that made her less engaging, like cinematically, right, made right. her made us made her hard to emotionally connect with based on the choices they made uh, using that rooting resume technique. And maybe the writers weren't doing that on purpose, but that was the impact of making those choices about her character. So uh, I found in this episode, specifically this key part of Jamie's uh, Jamie's rooting resume where he says, we wish we were more like them. That's like one of the core ones that we found all when we do it for these characters, when we, when we've done it for Nancy in nightmare on Elm street, when we did it for Sydney Prescott in scream, that's like one of the big ones. We wish we were more like them because they're so uh, bootstraps and engaging and making all the right choices. And uh, there's a, there's a quote that I like to use often that I got from Kevin Tenney, the director of Night of Demons and Witchboard. I went to a horror seminar of his years ago uh, on the Universal Studios lot in one of my few uh, trips to L.A. And he said, if your character makes all the right choices, the smart choices, the ones that we would make, too, and the monster still has the upper hand, that's when a monster is truly scary. I think... If you watch Aliens, Ripley is always making all the right choices. Um, and we wish we were more like her. If you watch 
Nightmare on Elm Street. Nancy is always making all the smart choices that we would make, and the monster still has the upper hand. Predator? Sydney, oh. then Predator, yeah. Sydney, Predator, Ash. You name you name a rousing horror hero. There, we wish we were more like them. In this movie, it's like it almost feels like the point is for them. It's the it's the inverse. We wish they were more like that, like us. Like Tess is consistently behaving, in my opinion, not like a human being. Like Kat Tess is the one of the first things she does is hand him her phone. Like she said like two words to this guy, and she literally hands her hands him her communication device, which is, in my opinion, quite the the literally the dumbest thing you could possibly do in that situation. Yeah, and totally. then she continues to she continues to make, in my opinion, almost the dumbest choices you could possibly make if, for self-preservation. Right. Right. Um, right. Due to her blind faith in the comfort and safety of the situation. AJ is the same thing in the face of a snuff room and the cave. He still he measures. Pulls, the- he pulls <laughs> out. And in my opinion, he's not behaving like a human being. Like, I don't think any human being on the earth would look at a snuff room and be like, it works for the movie, but I don't buy it. And for me, this for me, those root that, that rooting resume thing right there makes me not be able to feel anything beyond surface level for these characters. I do not feel any level of of connection, emotional connection I, with Tess or AJ because I wish they were more like us. <laughs> yeah. Can I, can I yeah. give one other reason? Um, yeah. I'm, one so, other- so I'm asking, what does that say? What's instructive about it? What, yeah, what do we learn right. about that? So, so I have two sides of it. On one hand, I think it is a way – there is something about horror that when people do things really stupid, yep, it, it can feel scarier because we're even more out of control. Like, oh, they're going in the basement. No, yep. don't go in the basement. Yep. Um, there is something to be Scream said. About literally that. commented on this, right? I mean, yeah. Yep. Yeah. And, and that's why I pro- that's why I commented rooting resumes in horror was the talking point I wanted to talk about right. how that here, changes the game. When you were talking about this, I, I thought of another reason why to make them smart is more interesting like like why to do the extra work to force them to go into the basement in some really intelligent way you know like Mm -hmm. like a smart person would even we would have to go into the basement yeah if you if you create it yeah if you create it and a a movie i remember i liked though i don't have any examples from it that did that really well was 10 cloverfield lane i remember she was really smart and active the lead character in that and um she was actively doing smart things, but the bad guy was always like two steps ahead of her. Still the situ- ahead of her. The yeah. situation was that bad. But I think there's an opportunity that if you see yourself doing that, if you're in the past doing that, you might have an opportunity to do something that Jimmy likes to talk about a lot, which is meaningful choices. You may be able to set up, if you see that, take that as a red flag that maybe you could set up some choice that shows character like maybe there's a way to reconfigure it that she has to do something that that is very bad because what? she's making a character decision based on who she is or something. and i and i actually do think the those choices that we're seeing tess make are meaningful but the result of that is i feel like she's not smart and uh <laughs> yeah. I will okay I, I mean like I agree with everything you say about Tess uh ex- I feel like the one time in the movie sort of has the exception to that is when Bill Skarsgård is missing that first time mm-hmm. like she is I mean like okay she's not maybe not the smartest <laughs> well person, look it's no but there it's, is a it's, there is a human being suffering and she doesn't know why you, and she's you, trying you, to save him but yeah. leaning into the red flag resume um, there's a there's a fifty percent possibility that he's luring her into there. True. And to You're me, right. to me, the lack of self preservation instincts in it those just moments, natural. I got you. Yeah. Is and, like there's uh, a fifty percent chance he's playing you, uh, and I think that's enough to leave the house if you want to live. It's uh, like, yeah. yeah. And it, just to go along with that, like I found her character. And it could be the actor. It could be her to be very intelligent. Like, like she, the she didn't buy performances. Like she's, the performance fantastic. is fantastic. She so, almost balances this problem out with her well, performance. Well, well that, like, I yeah. think, I think she, 
exacerbates the problem to or, an extent. Yeah, or that, yeah, because, guess, yeah. because her character seems like she's not buying anything Scar's Garden right. selling. Like, it's not somebody in there like, oh, okay, great. I'm coming in. Let's have a party. Let's open the booze. Let's do something. So, yeah, it makes yeah, her she, choices even yeah. seem even less intelligent. Right. It's yeah. like, she wouldn't do that. So you're saying you if know? it was more yeah, of an yeah. airhead, we might have bought all the things, the mistakes. There, mm-hmm. th- there's right, another yeah. character that's yep. just along yes. for the party. Yes. And like, oh, this guy's cute. I'm, let's, let's hang. Let's do it. Jamie, let's, you have articulated yeah. and i think that's what they're trying to do with aj but i just i just don't think anyone sees a snuff room and, and 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 sits on the bed and goes like oh shit like i mean this is gross jimmy i would almost <laughs> argue if we're, if like looking at it like that i'd almost argue the sec like i could almost <laughs> believe everything up until her waking up with the door open once that door is open you're you get out, out of there, of there dude. you get out of there it doesn't you get matter. out of there nothing dude. right he's he's but she continues in fact her yeah. most in her most insanely right. her her com, her the ones that like speak to a lack of self-preservation instinct the most are what happens after that like she's doubling down on on the <laughs> she just keeps choices doubling down right? that she duck she keeps doubling down on choices that are going to put her at at risk for a guy she barely she she said like had about 20 you know a couple hours the conversation with total right and yeah i think so, and, and so i mean like the reason that it might work for people only is because of what i think what you said jamie is like it's a little bit of a comedian being cruel to the character yeah. right and that's it yeah. kind of makes it fun because right. yeah. these things happening without these choices it right but but happy, so right. I, I I just thought it was interesting that we watched I I I am I am criticizing the movie but I'm also saying right, right. it works like it's why people it's why the movie has to exist it's why people love the movie it's why the movie's able to keep like basically the main reason the movie is able to keep you off balance is because characters are making choices that humans don't make um and so also, I think it, at the it's, surface it's the of like. It, and the the worst thing to do is have her make that choice and then go, oh, I'm acting like a person in a horror movie. Yeah, the wink, right? And she yeah. doesn't. So, 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 so I'm. I, I guess I'm. I'm trying to get to the, to the, to the lesson here of like, I think it works because it's a horror movie. Like, I think if you if you have if you inverse that, we wish they were more like us. Uh, like it just it's interesting that we found that in two movies in a row. And I had never really noticed that before because when we've been studying these horror movies, we found time and time again that these that these heroes, like Nancy, like 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 Ripley, like like uh, Ash, um, like Sydney, they're all we wish we were more like them is like one of the core things, you know. And here it's the opposite, and and it's it, it seems to be something in horror, like you said, Jamie. That's a tool that, that storytellers use to make us more engaged. Oh, you it, it, it don't almost, do that. You know what I mean? Like you know, to put it to make it more cultural, culturally relevant, it almost has the same effect that like watching fail videos online does. You know, yes, like like you watch people who are jumping off a roof into a pool and miss and stuff, (laughs) and those people made that decision like a human would. They they, Mm -hmm. they're a human being making a real decision, and you know we're watching it as entertainment online. Yeah. Yeah, we're watching Tess make all these really bad decisions. You and did a great job, Jamie. Figure, yeah, like sh- her performance is very in- makes her feel so very intelligent. But I'm saying her decisions are entertaining because they're so bad. <laughs> you know what I, I mean? Guess, like yeah, some of yeah. it is so like they're such bad decisions. When she's like <laughs> screaming how Justin Long is in the basement and he might die. Everybody, I can't only imagine seeing this with a big crowd. Everyone's probably slapping their heads, like, but also <laughs> screaming and laughing. You know what I mean? Like, right, are you right, serious? Right. There's some, right. uh, there's some aspect of the amusement park ride of a movie that I think that I, I agree to. with you. I agree with you. Yes, yeah, yeah. No, yeah. No, I agree. On the flip side, like Justin Long's character is a bit of a doofus, and the fact yeah, that yeah. he's down there measuring and stuff like that, even though it's obviously like torture dungeons and stuff, you kind of like. That's the difference between Tess and Justin Long. Like he's a clown, but she, from the second I meet her, is like on to everything that's going on. But she's still doing the decisions, and that's she's still making choices like she's, AJ yeah. does. Yeah, she, she yeah. knows that the script isn't the right choice, but she's got to do it anyway. <laughs> There's like an omniscient <laughs> hand pushing her forward, right? <laughs> yeah, that's the one thing that's like that's 
yeah, that that I think is a proceed with caution with having your characters behave in ways that don't ring true. Um, is 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 very uh very risky as a writer. It, well, like I um, said, the my one friend that she could not buy the movie because of these decisions because she didn't believe that that she's woman just, would do those well, things. She's like, yeah, yeah. she's like, I'm I'm that, a woman. I would not do any of these things. That like, that is yeah. that's the danger of doing this right, is right. once. Once you yes, what I'm saying, the, yeah. Once yeah. you think that character isn't real, then tension goes away because you're like the situation isn't real, and you start checking out: will the good thing happen or will the bad? Emotionally, happen? I've checked out. Yes, nope. and, and at the and service then, of at the service of it getting me shocked and whoa, and I had very surface level reactions, but emotionally, I checked out when they start when they since they behave in ways that to me don't ring true uh, based on what they've given us. So. And, and so like you're saying that when we talked like yesterday about it, when me and Jamie kind of were like, yeah, but there's some there's some laughs there and that's kind of the, the value. It's yeah. Like, that's kind of where it came back for you a little bit. There's a give and take. Yeah. yeah, yeah it's yeah. It's got to do these things in order to pull those other things off. So there's right. a give and take. And Jamie, I know you got to get out of here. Yeah. yeah. Man. Let's, I was going to um, say I, we, we did reach the end of everything we want to yeah. talk about. Um. <laughs> Did you guys have anything you wanted to? I know Jamie's already talked about the books a few times. <laughs> did uh, any either of you guys say anything you wanted to plug or anything like that? Tell no people. plugs on my end. I, there, there is one thing um, that I just I got this email while we were talking is uh, my Save the Cat rights for TV book during the Black Friday week. It goes on sale for two ninety nine. That's a slow on Kindle on Kindle. <laughs> the Kindle book is two ninety nine. If you want to pick it up. The week I don't know when this is coming out. Monday, Tuesday. I don't know. Monday. Whenever you get it, if you get it this week, if you grab it, go check it out. Save the cat rates for TV two ninety nine. Never be cheaper. So go buy it. That's great. Um, awesome. Also, I wanted to say, like, look, uh, two things. One, rate us on Apple Podcast if you use Apple Podcasts. The new, the new feed. The new feed, not the Thundergrunt feed. Not on Thundergrunt. Yes. yes. <laughs> rate the new feed. If you ha if you'd used Apple Podcasts, thank you, thank you very much for doing that. And also, I wanted to say, look, uh, I I've been producing this show now for uh, five years, and I've never asked for a dime from anybody. And now I made a Patreon, so my Patreon is patreon.com slash Bob Rose sucks. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that's that's the Patreon, and I, we actually I uh, just wanted to say I actually have one Patreon member from this show. Uh, it's my buddy from high school. He, he's been a listener ever since we started. His name is Eddie Hodges, so I want to thank him. And if you and if you join the Patreon, I'll mention you on the show. Hell yeah! And, and it helps keep it helps support me, the time I put in, and it pay, it keeps it ad free. So that's awesome. Yeah, yeah. Thank thanks you, to Eddie. everyone. The, a bunch of people. Uh, after we put the call out, uh, after 86 episodes of never asking for a review, it really helps. We're trying to make the show grow. Yeah. So, um, and the show's moved to a new feed. So writer's blockbuster screenwriting podcast. Now, if you can, if you like the show, uh, and want to leave us a review, it really helps and it'll help more people discover it and give and us a reason to keep doing it <laughs> and share it. You know, if you, if you, if you don't want to do any of that stuff, just share it, you know? Yeah. But thank you for listening. It, it all helps. Yeah. It all helps. It all helps. Thank yeah. you. It all helps Jamie yeah. to repeat things every episode. Yeah. <laughs> that's what we want. <laughs> that's, that's right. It's Jamie that's right. defining things over and over again. It's like, I can't it's like wait a... till we get to the recordings where we just press a button. <laughs> <laughs> right. I feel, I feel like, you know, 30 years from now to be like some neurological test. Like, like listen to him devolve and, and he's going to say the exact same thing over, over, over several over. years. But, well, yeah. All right. Well, thank you, everybody. Thanks for listening, Thanks. everyone. Hey, this is Bob Rose, and thank you for listening to Writer's Blockbusters. If you'd like to financially support the show, please consider joining my Patreon. I've been producing the podcast for several years completely out of pocket, and I'd like to keep producing it ad-free and no longer at a loss. If you'd like to help, head on over to patreon.com slash 
Bob Rose sucks. That's right. Bob Rose sucks. And if you want the one and only Jimmy George to help polish up that writing project you're kind of struggling with, head on over to scriptbutcher.com. As a listener, you already know he's the best there is. Scriptbutcher.com. You can also support the show by simply sharing it or leave us a review on Apple Podcasts. We appreciate both. Thank you for listening and see you next episode.